Just give it a moment before the um, piece. We're all set. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, we will now uh, open up today's public hearing for the Commerce Committee uh, this Tuesday, March 9th. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, we have, uh, Madam Clerk, what, 10 items on our public hearing list today? Uh, yep. Yeah that we will um, be looking forward to getting testimony on. Um, and so, uh, Madam Co-Chair, comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, looking forward to a productive uh, public hearing today and good to see everyone virtually. Thank you. Um, Senator Martin? I am good to go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and uh, Representative Buckaby? I don't believe he's here yet, I'm sure. Oh, oh, he's not on yet. Okay, all right. Well, we'll give him time to chime in if need be. Um, and so without further ado, um, we will proceed to our list of folks who have uh, signed up to testify um, on our agenda today. Um, and first off, we have um, what looks like the entire department of DECD with us. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who who's not on this list, um, but we have Commissioner Lehman um, with Deputy Commissioner Thames, um, George Norfleet, Kristen Kirker uh, Stewart, Christine Castaway, um, Jenny Schofield, Catherine Labadia, um, Alexandra Durham, Elizabeth Shapiro, and of course I've seen our good friend Kyle Abercrombie on there, and also Maya has joined us as well. So listen, uh, thanks uh, to the entire, almost entire um, DECD shop for being with us. Uh, Commissioner? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Yes, we um, we thought we'd go with the safety and numbers route today. And if everyone gets three minutes, we have two hours is kind of our calculus. Okay, so. Well, you don't. So we'll put that on the record. All right, my, my attempt at humor, and I'm using up my own time. So first, Senator Hartley, uh, Representative Simmons, Senator Martin, as well as uh, Rep Buckby, I guess, will be coming. Um, what, what I wanted to testify here is in support of Senate Bill 936, uh, and, and this is a bit of a grab bag, and that is why you have significant amounts of DECD staff, because there's eight or nine items that we want to touch on and there may be questions on. Uh, so I will, hit, I will hit it at a high level, and then we'll get right into questions. So the first part of the bill uh, addresses both uh, the members and the duties of the state has Historic Preservation Board. These are largely technical fixes to uh, convert the name of the board, as well as make sure that we have consistency within uh, the state statute and how the state board works vis-a-vis uh, -vis the federal requirements. And lastly, we're proposing expanding board terms from to three years from one year, uh, again, all for the State Historic Preservation Board. The second part of the legislation addresses the dry cleaning fund uh, and two specific fixes that we think are important as it relates to the dry cleaning fund. So this is a fund where uh, there's roughly you know, there's a significant queue, I think, of roughly 40 uh, dry cleaners right now that there has not been funding for them. And it can be a very long queue. The two things we're proposing here is one, to allow um, uh, folks to remain in the queue. So if you have a dry cleaning business and you sell it, um, the, the person that buys it from you will be able to remain in the queue uh, with the cleanup being done and certifying that payments into the fund have been made. The second thing the legislation proposes is allowing DECD uh, to utilize funds uh, from the dry cleaning fund for administrative and legal expenses. We, we've actually been using uh, Brownsfields and other legal expenses or other funds to pay legal expense, expenses. And we wanna make sure that dry cleaning fund pays for its own legal exp expenses uh, from a good governance perspective. Uh, the last two parts basically do two things. One, we're, we're proposing eliminating inactive advisory groups, uh, inactive or dormant. There are several groups uh, related to arts, tourism, and some business that uh, just haven't been operating either because they're, they're redundancies. There's new boards that have taken place uh, in arts and tourism, uh, and some of these boards just aren't operating. So the auditors have come to us with this. We just don't want to have uh, statutes on the books that suggest there should be these boards uh, when they're either not necessary or they're just not happening for whatever reason. So can go into more detail there again, but that's a bit of cleanup for good governance. Uh, the same thing from a reporting perspective. DECD now does a very comprehensive annual report. Uh, we are asked, though, as part of that annual report to 
uh, certify and, and look at certain programs that DCD doesn't oversee and we don't have accountability for. So what we're proposing is, is cleaning up, get, getting rid of any duplication or redundancy in reports that we're required to do, eliminate reports that uh, just aren't either aren't able to be done or are done by other agencies or other parts of the government. Uh, and again, this has been an, an auditor's point. So we wanna make sure that there is clear accountability. The DCD annual report, I'm a big believer in, but we, we should only be held accountable to programs that we oversee and where we have access to the information. Moving on to tourism and arts quickly, um, uh, regional tourism districts, we're proposing two things here. One, the, the central regional tourism district, there's a mandate that that's housed within DECD that's no longer necessary. Uh, we, we're proposing eliminating that. And then secondly, if there are unused funds uh, that are appropriated for tourism districts, that those unused funds come back to DECD and can be used for statewide marketing. We just wanna make sure that if for some reason any of the monies are unspent, um, they, they don't stay uh, at regional districts and they do come back to be utilized or repurposed. Uh, two more things, Senator, then I, I promise I will, I will finish up here. Uh, Arts Council, um, we're proposing quick amendments between the Arts Council and the Arts Council Foundation. As it's written right now, uh, the two are effectively the same and, and artists that are on the Arts Council um, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to be involved in the foundation, some of the fundraising that's required um, at that aspect. So we're, we're proposing really disentangling the two, having an Arts Council and separately an Arts Council Foundation. Uh, and then in addition, we're proposing broadening the Arts Council Board to 15 members from 13 to ensure greater diversity uh, at, that, at, that, at that board. Uh, last thing for me, or last two things I should say, uh, Archaeological sites. We uh, we're protecting. We are proposing some legislation here that uh, protects archaeological sites, specifically around Native Americans. This came to us as a recommendation. Our Shippo group supports it, uh, and effectively, this again would make uh, Connecticut general statutes consistent with federal statutes on preserving some of these archaeological sites. Uh, and then, lastly, um, the the thing we're proposing related to what we call the relocation requirement. And this is a bit technical, but if any state funds are are given out to businesses, uh, there's a requirement in the statutes, I think dating back decades, that those um, businesses remain in the state of Connecticut for 10 years. There's a 10 year residency that is mandated. And what we're proposing is that really two exceptions to that rule. We, th we think it's a good rule in general, but we think two exceptions should be there. One, if it's a small business as defined by uh, the Small Business Express guidelines, which is really 100 or fewer employees, I believe. Or if, if we are giving federal funds out, um, you know, whether it's CARES Act, for example, or what could happen in the future, we, we would like to be able to not have to require uh, that 10 year residency. It's just, it's a bit onerous and it doesn't, it's a very blunt instrument that doesn't fit other circumstances. So small businesses and federal dollars, we, we, we would like an exemption based on the commissioner's discretion. That's not as of right, but the commissioner has the ability to, to do that. Senator, thank you for uh, he hearing me out there. I know I went a little bit longer than three minutes, but I'm, I'm here to answer any questions as is the whole agency, as you said. Yes, um, thanks so much uh, for being with us. And yeah, I would just like to point out that um, in terms of you know our, our new uh, parameters and how we're operating and so forth, it just made a lot of sense to, I think, um, put these concepts together under one, um, one bill uh, so that hopefully um, we can be a little bit more efficient uh, because of the other challenges that we're facing, um, you know, this session in particular. So that's kind of why you see this amalgamation of concepts, um, a number of which I should point out, um, Commissioner, we have had before us previously. Um, so they, they are not essentially new um, concepts. In, in large part. Um, and I, I just want to, uh, as a first comment, talk about the dry cleaning fund because there was great angst about that in terms of you know what we were doing, um, particularly when you know we worked on the um, on the transfer act and the release based uh, transition uh, of what the integrity of that fund would be. So the fund is not changing at all. The parameters of it do not change. It, it, it just speaks to um, how this is actually rolled out. Um, and if I'm understanding this correctly, that uh, this is a process that is pretty laborious, takes um, a considerable amount of time. And so if you have an entity and uh, a dry cleaner, for example, that um, has a, a is in the fund and has an application in the fund um, and there is a change of ownership, uh, that particular application 
is remains active and in place according to when it was initially filed so that even with the transfer of property the um the the new applicant uh, is not disadvantaged with respect to participating in that fund. That, that's correct. So the, this would do two things. It would, it would enable, uh, in your example, the, the new applicant, the new owner, to maintain the old owner's space in the queue, again, assuming they contributed to the fund. And as opposed to, you know, you know, Senator Harley, you sell your dry cleaning place to me, all of a sudden I get to the end of the line again. And the line is roughly 40 uh, dry cleaners long, and I think we're doing two or three a year. So it's, uh, it's just from a fairness perspective, we didn't think that was right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, and the truth is, you know, these are small businesses uh, primarily um, and wherever we can uh, support small businesses and also um, the environment, that, that is clearly uh, a win-win. So I have a few other questions, but I'm going to defer to my colleagues. Um, uh, Representative Simmons, would you, uh, you have any questions? Yes, thank you, Madam co-chair and uh, thank you commissioner for your testimony today and, and all of your work and, and leadership at DECD. Um, so uh, a couple of questions um, with respect to the uh, statewide uh, marketing tourism fund. Um, I, I appreciate in your testimony that you know any unspent funds from the, the tourism districts would revert back to that fund. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on, on how much we currently have in that fund and just how we're kind of overall thinking about our, our tourism marketing, you know, especially in light of COVID and kind of the unique opportunity we, we have right now to attract tourists to our state, especially with the industry that's been hit so hard. I um, wondering if you could elaborate on that. So if I, if I think I'm understanding your question, and I shouldn't take this opportunity to introduce uh, part of our team. So Christine Gastaway uh, oversees marketing here for DECD, and she's on the Zoom as well. But uh, I'll start. So the, the statewide marketing fund, I believe, is around $4 million. It was for the past biennium, and, and it's a plan to be that amount for this biennium. As, as I, I think I mentioned to some of you in the past, you know, on a per capita basis, that $4 million is, is light relative to other states. And we're broadly utilizing that to market the state. So it's how we market the state, uh, whether it's to residents, you know, again, business marketing, I got a question the other day at appropriations on this, that, that is not your geared towards business marketing, that's broadly marketing the state with, with a focus on tourism. I, I do think there, there could be, um, and, and certainly if there were incremental funds, that's an area where I think you, you get a real return, you know, anywhere from two to four dollars for every dollar spent in terms of incremental tourism and revenue coming into the state. But um, that, that four million is, is the main statewide marketing fund. I don't want to conflate that though with the, the money that's allotted to the tourism districts and allocated to the districts, Representative Simmons, because that, that is what we're really focused on in this legislation where if any of that money is unspent, that's not at DECD through Christine and her team, that that money does come back as opposed to stay at the regional tourism districts. Christine, anything you want to add there or, or amend to my comments? Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner Lehman. And nice to see you again, Representative Simmons and Senator Hartley. Um, yeah, just, just a couple of quick comments. As David pointed out, the approximately 4.2 million that is in the statewide tourism marketing fund. It is, um, as, as you saw in the testimony, 1.9 is spent on media, and that is largely through the lens of tourism. There is a very small proportion there that helps us to just leverage the overall live work play that you've seen come out over the last few years. Um, so we are able to, again, attract not only visitors, but also encourage that Connecticut is a great place to not only visit, but to make a home and have a career. And a lot of that is driven through the content on ctvisit.com, but also to ct.com. And then just recently, the new blog that launched CT for Me, which is really trying to get that testimonial type of um, content out there about why young talent has chosen to come to Connecticut and to start a family and have a career. So um, trying to do a lot uh, across the board. And then certainly regarding um, the tourism districts to answer your question a little bit about funding. Uh, right now on a fiscal year, they get approximately 400,000 each. Um, so it, it, if that helps, and, and that's, that's separate from the 4.2 that statewide marketing has. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Commissioner. And thanks, Christine, for that answer. Good to see you again, Christine. Thanks for all your, your good work. Um, 
Another question about with respect to marketing and uh, Commissioner, very much appreciate your testimony on uh, House Bill 5482 on um, implementing the recommendations of the Public Private Marketing Working Group. And I thought that um, what you highlighted in terms of what DCD and Advanced CT are doing was really helpful and would encourage members to kind of look at um, you know, all the ways that, that we're working to promote our state, because I think sometimes we don't always, you know, see them within our state, but we're doing a lot that, you know, maybe other states are seeing. Um, and also there's some, you know, really great kind of social media campaigns that I think members should look at and, and share with their districts to help amplify these efforts. Um, and, and I'm wondering kind of overall, and also want to thank uh, Representative Leeper for her leadership on this bill and for really um, promoting, uh, enhancing our marketing efforts. Um, but I wanted to ask kind of overall in terms of how we're thinking about data and, and marketing metrics, um, if, if you have a sense on kind of the overall uh, return on investment on our marketing dollars, um, and if we're tracking things like conversion rates, for example, when someone clicks on the CT visit site, does that translate into a visit to our state and you know, what other metrics we're, we're sort of looking at um, on our, what we know is limited marketing dollars we have. Um, so yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think Christine is best suited to, uh, to answer that because I know we look at a lot of data. Christine? Yes, thank you. Um, so again, just to jump in real quick, uh, absolutely metrics is a key part of everything we do. We have um, a research report that we can certainly send as an addendum uh, you know, to that testimony that will really break that down for you. We, we track everything. In terms of that conversion rate, we have been using a tool um, specifically on the tourism side, which was a rival list that does look at that actual conversion. Um, so it's technology that allows us to see if our digital ad is served up on a device, does that device then cross into our radius of what we would deem a travel or a visit. So there is a lot of technology tools in place to help us look at that. Um, in addition, tracking not only website visitation, like I said, ctvisit.com is our call to action on everything we do for the tourism side of the house. Um, and, and we get up to over 6 million visits uh, annually. And that has just been incremental over the last 10 years, um, which is really attributed to not only being highly efficient from a marketing standpoint, but also um, the search efforts, the social media and the content feeding. It's really the content that is driving a lot of the traffic into the state and the engagement. I would just like to point out, um, you know, over the last few years, especially when you're tracking social media marketing, uh, it, the algorithms, as we all hear, has changed a little bit. And it's more about that engagement uh, as opposed to, you know, just looking at the number of followers. So, you know, for example, we have one hashtag campaign for Connecticut, you know, support Connecticut businesses that we've been tracking on both the tourism and the economic development side. And it has over 7 million impressions, over almost 100,000 click throughs. Um, so we really do try to look at everything. And in addition, I'll just um, touch upon email marketing, just another sort of data point. And again, we could probably go on for hours and I know um, <laughs> that is not needed right now. But when we do email communications or e-blasts, we average about a 20% open rate, which is much higher than the, than the uh, industry average for that type of an effort. So we really do have metrics behind everything and we'd be happy to share more. That would be great. Thanks, Christine. And, and thanks again for all of your work on this. I think that marketing is so critical right now, you know, especially for our state. We have such a unique opportunity um, to, to really attract people and businesses and tourists to our state right now. So appreciate all your efforts and, and want to encourage folks to, to look at, you know, all the sites you've created to ct.com, ctvisit.com, DC for business, CT for me, and all the kind of hashtags and social media brand campaigns you've done. If there's anything that we can do to help amplify that message and, and get out to our chambers and businesses and our districts, um, let us know. Cause I think it, it's great if we can all kind of coordinate and work together um, to, to broadcast and attract people to our state. So thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Simmons. Um, Representative Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome commissioner team. Um, I'm going to go back to SB 936. I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, and thank you for your written testimony. Very helpful <laughs> compared to the three-minute version. Um, so in 
Section 15, and you touched upon it, um, the removal of lines 501 through 523. Um, and if I understood you correctly, it's mainly uh, that language called for um, uh, an analysis and recommendations uh, on business assistance programs, whether they are tax credits, grants, loans, or other types of assistance. And it sounds like that was removed because DECD doesn't oversee those programs. Um, so if I understood that correctly, I just wanted to get a sense of the rest of that statute seems to uh, require summary data, uh, sort of a recitation about data versus the analysis and recommendation piece. So I want to make sure that the programs you do oversee contain that component. Um, but then secondarily, uh, your thoughts about that missing piece for these other programs, are other agencies undertaking that type of granular analysis? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll start and then the team can, can fill in here too. You know, I, I think our view is uh, certainly anything where, where taxpayer money, tax credits are given out that DCD oversees, that should be summarized, that should be in our annual report, there should be a recommendation continue, not continue, watch list, however you want to call it. And, and the DCD annual report does that, in, in my opinion. Uh, and I think it does that well by program. And then in addition to that, I, I testified, I guess it was uh, almost a year ago now, where we, we testified as it relates to the annual report, what, what do we want to continue? What do we not want to continue? Good use, bad use of taxpayer money. We should continue all of that, Representative. I, I think Great. what our version to is, if it's a program that we don't oversee, it's very difficult to e either summarize or make a judgment on that, whether it's DOL or Connecticut Innovations. There's other as other agencies that are doing that and making those decisions from a governance perspective. They, they should be reporting out on their programs and making judgments on their programs. So that's the intent. Um, Kyle or Glenn, anything you guys want to add in here? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Hi, Representative. I would just Hello. kind of <laughs> echo uh, David's comments and just to give you kind of a concrete example, right? So Connecticut Innovation administers the sales and use tax program, and they report on that as part of their annual reporting uh, requirements to state auditors. And so we are then in turn uh, ch charged with reporting on that as part of our annual report, even though we do not administer the program, we do not do any of the analysis. We really li literally just ask them for the data and just copy and paste it in our report. But as part of the annual review from state auditors of our report, we get dinged because they're asking for certain analysis or certain validation that we don't have any jurisdiction or control over. And so again, that's really the intent to remove those types of requirements and remove that duplication because there's agencies that are already doing that as part of their requirements. Thank you, Ms. Thames. And um, so do you feel that the other agencies are meeting the same sort of litmus test, if you will, of providing the recommendations and analysis. I have found DECD to have a great annual report with a lot of data. Um, I'm not sure I've seen the same from other agencies. Um, so is your sense that, uh, I, I bring it up because does this body need to look at what the other agencies are doing to make sure that we are getting regular analysis, recommendations, keep, move on, you know, to make sure we don't have programs that aren't working on the books? I believe they're fulfilling their statutory obligation and that they are providing similar analysis and data that DECD provides for our programs for their programs. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then my second question is about section 19 and the, oh no, I'm sorry, section one, the State Historic Preservation Review Board. Um, it seems like a little thing, but it does raise concerns uh, for me around racial, ethnic, gender, geographic diversity. Uh, it's, it's two small changes made, um, changing the term from one year to three years and potentially reducing the size of the body from 10 members to six to 10. Um, and the problem for me is that the federal law requires the majority to hold certain uh, professional credentials um, 
someone versed in history, historic archaeology, and architectural history in particular. Um, but the rest of the federal statute basically just says members must have demonstrated competence, interest, or knowledge in historic preservation. So if you reduce to six, and when I look at that review board, and I say this respectfully, it is mainly male, older, and Caucasian. Um, so by reducing the size and the term, I, I just worry that equity is not being pursued here. So I feel very uncomfortable with that change and I'd love your thoughts there. Yeah, so we have, uh, that's a great question, Representative. So we have uh, Jenny Schofield as well as uh, Kathy Labadia and then Liz Shapiro here. So Jenny, do you wanna address that in terms of why the six to 10 and your thoughts in terms of diversity on that board? Yes, and, and thank you. I appreciate that comment. Um, so the federal requirement um, for the board is that it is five people, and the, those five people have there has to be a archaeologist that specializes in prehistory, an archaeologist that specializes in the historic period, an architect, a historian, an architectural historian, and then if you have more than that, you can fill in. Um, with people who have other areas of expertise. And uh, there is a desire to represent the population of Connecticut um, in multiple ways. Um, the intent is not actually to reduce the total number. So right now we have nine members. Um, we are fairly diverse between men and women and with age. We are seeking to increase racial diversity. Um, and so we have nine members right now in one vacancy that we're hoping to fill. Um, the reason to change the language here, the, the shall consist of language is simply to allow a little breathing room when um, people change over or people decide to step down. Um, we just wanna loosen that so we have more time to find the right fit. Um, because it's really important on this board not to to rush into appointing somebody um, because we're looking for for all kinds of diversity and also diversity in areas of expertise. And sometimes um, there's also a big, this is a volunteer board consisting of professionals who are in high demand. And a lot of times um, we're asking for a big time commitment for them to, to volunteer and work for free. And sometimes it takes a while to find somebody to place on the board that is able to come to all the meetings and do the work required. Now, my under thank you for that. Uh, my understanding of the federal statute is that, you know, it's sort of general language about uh, having a reasonable amount of time to fill vacancies. Is your, your feeling that unless you restrict the language, you won't be able to meet that threshold? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, again, the federal requires five. We've traditionally had 10. We don't intend to, to not have 10 be the goal. Um, we really just looking to loosen the language to allow more time to appoint people. Um, and also to make sure our, our language right now in our um, bylaws, which we've just updated, um, says that you can vote with a majority. Um, and we've at times, we recently changed that to be majority from a higher number. And we've at times struggled to meet quorum, um, which is an issue for efficiency when you're only meeting four times per year. Um, so again, it's just to allow a little bit of flexibility for those time periods when you know, people decide to step down because they're too busy or um, they have other commitments. Um, it, again, it's it's just really, it. Connecticut's an uh, in, incredible state, um, but we are small and sometimes it, it is really hard to find people who um, can give this much time. As someone who has served in many <laughs> roles, I understand, I understand. Um, so of the nine members currently, how many are women? Uh, we have about three. 
Um, I think we have four right now. Okay, I thought it was three. And uh, what's the age range? Well, I Would haven't pulled them all, <laughs> not to be rude, um, but I believe it's about um, 45 through 85. Thank you. No, I definitely understand the sort of day-to-day -day challenge. I, for one, would be very uncomfortable writing this type of change into statute because I think it could be um, addressed with a bylaw change. Um, and I would not like to see us restrict um, any opportunity to be more inclusive uh, in here in Connecticut. But thank you for the answer. Very helpful. Thank you. Oh, and I'm sorry, I did, uh, since Caroline raised uh, HB 5482, um, I was, and Christine, thank you for your explanation about data, very interesting. I was just interested, since I'm new to this committee, is um, your marketing geared toward, it always seems very difficult to do state level marketing, right? Like some of the most successful campaigns are targeted to a city or district. Um, so I was, if you could just talk, like give me a one minute primer on um, sort of the efficacy of statewide marketing and how you target the, target the marketing, like are there key demographics within that umbrella that you're working toward? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's, it's always an interesting one. So um, what we do, you'd be amazed, we have matrix that we track to make sure that all of our assets that we develop are being diverse by region, um, by type of business, by type of attraction, but also the target that would be interested in that actual attraction. So um, it, it, it's, it's, it's no easy undertaking when we go out to develop, say a TV spot, a 30 second TV spot. It is, it is literally a puzzle piece, making sure that we're showing different age range, different ethnicity, different locations within the state, highlighting different cities um, to really sort of give that breadth and depth view of what we have to offer. Um, and again, it, it is a small state, but we have 169 towns that we represent. And, and we also, um, through the efforts of what we've done on CT Visit, you can also, when you go onto that website, there's a really um, interesting feature called While in the Neighborhood. So if you look up a particular attraction or venue, we're always cross promoting what is also in that area. So, so really trying to magnify as much as we can um, everything we have. In addition to, we write a, an enormous amount of content. Content is king right now in marketing. Um, and that is where a lot of our focus has been over the last few years and really trying to drive um, content that delivers that message as well. So we have a lot of content around livable, walkable towns. Um, also, you know, how to make a city your home and, and, and what cities to visit. So we, we do spotlights also um, in that regard to try to, again, get that cross um, message out there. Thank you so much for that. I just want to say uh, before I yield <laughs> the rest, uh, end this, I so appreciate all the work of DECD. I think you're doing a fantastic job and I'm happy to be in Connecticut. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Representative Thomas. And so um, Jenny and Commissioner, I would ask you with regards to the, the um, uh, colloquy here on um, the Historic Preservation Board to kind of go back um, and reassess. I understand and am very appreciative of the, the, the need for flexibility. Also, the fact that it, it is sometimes difficult um, to meet the requirements of quorum um, and, and attendance and so forth. And then also when you have those gaps in, at times when people are leaving. But anyway, if there is some other um, middle ground that we might um, identify with regard to that conversation. Um, you could Senator, get back. Yeah. 
Yeah. Senator, if I may there, and we have one of our, our, our legal experts, Chris, on the line, but what, what Representative Thomas suggested, which I think is worth discussion, is could there be a bylaw fix as opposed to a statutory fix? And I'm not sure if we have a legal view on does the statute need to be fixed or can we can we fix this at the board level of the committee? Yeah. Chris, not to put you on the spot, but do you want to weigh in on that or do we need to come back to the committee on that? Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, Chris Kirker Stewart, I'm staff attorney at, at DECD. Um, yeah, I would like to take a look at that actually as I sit here. I don't know the answer. Um, we could take a look and see if we can do that internally without going to the level of a statute. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back. Message message received. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Senator Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioner. This shouldn't uh, take too long. Uh, regarding the the, uh, the funds that you are looking to, I guess the uh, cultural districts uh, that you issue $400,000, I guess on an annual basis, is that the funds that you're looking to, if they don't spend them, spend the money that you're asking for them to send it back to you? Correct. And how do, I, I guess, uh, how do you, ver uh, when you get it, give it, is it on a one-time uh, $400,000 at the beginning of the year? And then at the end of the year, you're going to audit and then, you know, see if they spent the money accordingly or, pro or appropriately. Yeah, Christine, do you want to weigh in that the the oversight we have over those funds and how they get dispersed? Sure, thank you. Um, so they're actually paid out quarterly, so they don't receive it in one lump sum. It's a hundred thousand dollars per quarter, um, and then we balance out as we come into that last quarter of the fiscal year. So the intent, well, the purpose or the request is that if those funds are appearing to be unspent that had been allocated uh, evenly throughout the year, that those funds then come back into the state and then they could be applied back into the statewide marketing fund. So do you make sure that they, they're they not spending it all on administration, but actually spending it on marketing purposes? Yes, absolutely. There are a lot of checks and balances in place. There are marketing committee meetings. Um, we have regional committee meetings. So the state also has to re review and approve all of the budget allocations so that we can see how much is spent across each category. Lastly, Christine or, or Commissioner, how much uh, are you, you know, are, I guess, is there, is, does there seem to be a lot of money not being spent that you're asking for it to be returned to you and if, if it is returned to you does it do you keep it in for your future budget or does it get placed back into uh the general fund christine you want to keep going <laughs> sure um so so certainly tourism is very much as you can imagine a a seasonal uh effort and you know within the last year with the pandemic um, we, we've all had to, you know, look at things just a little bit differently. Um, so I don't have a current tally of, of what they have. Uh, currently, everyone is in the midst of really amping up their plans to help um, all of our businesses uh, this spring, summer to drive more visitation and to get people out to, you know, eat, stay, play, uh, you know, local. So those campaigns are all coming into place. So within the next couple of months, we will have a balance of what is in those budgets. And then uh, finally, to answer your question, um, you know, I don't anticipate, I wouldn't anticipate it to be a tremendous amount, um, because like I said, we all know these tourism campaigns are so desperately needed uh, to help our businesses. Um, but if there is an amount remaining that it would come back into the state and the intent is for it to be applied back into the statewide tourism fund, so that we could put that towards the statewide uh, marketing campaign that I spoke about earlier. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Martin. Um, and I'm sorry if I, if I missed this in your explanation, but on that subject, we have had this situation um, at least once that I can recall where there was unspent funds. Um, and did we have to do special legislation for that? Not that I recall. Maybe Christine's aware of special legislation on that. But I, I know there has been issues with unspent funds, but I, I don't think it's been pervasive. So we've, never, we've never done anything about that. I, I thought I remembered that there was one district or something that hadn't spent their money um, and, and 
conversation came up. I think it has happened again. I wouldn't call it pervasive based on my experience. Again, the team should jump in, but Senator, maybe what the, the, this legislation, I believe we were pursuing last year pre pandemic. So that, that may have been what you were recalling. Well, no, I remember that, but I thought that there was a, a, a case in point. Christine, are you aware of a special legislation? I'm not aware of special legislation, but I, but I would like to point out that um, in the last year, there has been a lot of focused effort on really looking at the way each of the regions are managed and there have been different leadership uh, put into some of those regions um, and also contracts were revisited. And again, the oversight in the administration from a state perspective has also been um, looked at within the last year. So I can't speak too much to what was done previously, but this is our first year um, with a little bit of a new structure with new uh, people at the table for each region. Um, and, and again, unfortunately, it was a year of a pandemic. So <laughs> we're, we're in a little bit of uh, new territory there. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks uh, for that. Um, Rep Leeper. Thanks, Madam Chair. And thank you, Commissioner and DCD staff for being here. I just wanna sort of second what Rep Thomas said and that I'm really grateful for all the work you do. And I just want to share that I often hear really positive things about your agency and as someone who previously worked for a government agency. It's not that common to hear positive things about uh, government agencies from folks. So I think you're doing just a really thorough and thoughtful job. I, my question is about um, the tourism campaigns and sort of what steps you guys are taking to get feedback directly from whoever is intended to be the beneficiary of that giving campaign and how they're they're experiencing the benefits of those campaigns. It might be for Christine, I'm not yeah, sure. I was say, Christine's on a roll today. She's, um, <laughs> that's where all the compliments come to the agency. No, but Christine can talk to me. <laughs> okay. No problem. Uh, good morning, Representative Leaper. So um, absolutely, I, again, everything we do as a touch point, but specifically getting to the feedback component, I think is what you're after. We do do a brand awareness and campaign study every year. So, and that has been fielded consistently, you know, over the, at least the 10 to last 15 years. So we have been tracking uh, intent to visit, response to ads, uh, if our ads give a greater intent to visit in the future, we look at all different types of attribute and uh, awareness um, indicators so that we can see if we're moving that lever in terms of um, motivating people to, to come to Connecticut to plan a trip um, and, and to visit. But in addition, I would also go back to social media. Social media is a great place where we get absolutely authentic feedback every single day. If you join our channels, you will see um, these are unprompted in many cases, but it is state residents that come on and, and they literally pledge, you know, their, their love for the state on a post. Like if, you know, especially um, as seasonal images start to pop up, people always comment and share, love Connecticut, great state, so great to be home, you know, look forward to visiting my, my favorite, you know, restaurant or attraction. So we, we do it both in a very research focused avenue with the brand awareness study every year, but we're also always keeping our pulse on what the conversation is out on social media. And, and we learn a lot from that. And then we actually repost some of that content as well, user generated content. So it's not just um, the State Office of Tourism that's putting that messaging out there, that we put that authentic voice of our own state residents out there as well. So are, thank you for that. I think that's so helpful. Are you guys partnering sort of with either local chambers of commerce or communities who have their own local uh, director for community and economic development so that they are also using the same um, campaigns and hashtags and, and sharing of the resources you guys are putting out there to kind of build on, on these campaigns? Yes, absolutely. So we have outreach meetings with the industry uh, frequently um, throughout the year to make sure they are aware of exactly what you said, our marketing campaigns, when we're in market, hashtags that we use. We also have a very robust um, industry e-blast that we send out to a very large distribution. So we also let them know ahead of time. 
So as we're getting ready to amp up our efforts for the next season, we have to switch out imagery, for example, on CT visits. So we make sure that they're aware of the type of images we're looking for. We also have a very um, thorough public relations um, arm to our efforts in that we're always reaching out and definitely um, to chambers um, and to different organizations throughout the state, even directly to some of the towns themselves, when we have, say, a travel writer who's coming into the state and they're looking for a unique experience, um, our public relations firm will work one-on-one -on -one with that town or region um, to make sure that we're leveraging that opportunity across the board. That's wonderful. And then um, another another group that's doing such phenomenal work is Advanced CT. And I was wondering, I know one of their like sort of four arms is specifically marketing. So I was wondering how um, you guys are working together in, or if you're working together uh, in these types of campaigns. Absolutely. Um, we actually meet weekly. <laughs> so so um, we're, you know, it's still a work in progress. We're aligning um, as much as we can. And as David mentioned earlier, they are tasked with the business recruitment end of marketing. Um, so really going after the site selectors and communicating directly with the CEOs. And a lot of their efforts are just getting off the ground, but um, we are very connected to them and partner with them as much as we can. I think it's wonderful. So often in this work, we talk about not for us without us. And I think that applies to our businesses too. And, and the feedback I've been getting is just that a lot of businesses really feel like maybe for the first time in a while, you guys are doing this work with them. And, and I hope you guys are receiving that feedback. And, and if I can, just one other question, because in regard to um, 5482, technology is changing so, so quickly. And so I was wondering if you guys have given any thought to there being a sort of a time period for reevaluation as a part of this work to make sure there's not requirements where that technology has moved beyond um, what we're putting in statute. David, do you want me to take that one? <laughs> if you go to time period of mind, I'm, I'm open-minded there. So I defer to our marketing expert in terms of, you know, the pace at which the industry is changing. And we, we always want to make sure that we're, we're being effective in any money we spent or time we spent. But Christine, I don't know what you think the right time period is in terms of evaluation. Yeah, you know, to be honest, we evaluate after every campaign that we do. So to your point earlier, technology is changing constantly, just like I mentioned earlier, how we've even been approaching social media marketing and digital marketing and, and um, video streaming, right? So uh, all of that uh, changes every single day. So, you know, we evaluate the effectiveness of our tactics. We also look at where we get the most bang for our buck, making sure that we're, you um, Get, getting the leverage that we need out of each tactic and then adjusting as we go forward into the next campaign. So um, I, I think it's, it's constant, if not um, needed, because technology, you know, what we knew yesterday is going to be different tomorrow. All right. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you uh, for the time, Madam Chair. Representative. Uh, thank you, Rep. Uh, Leeper. And uh, this is a very important conversation. And so I'm kind of watching, um, you know, how nimble we are, um, in particularly in this new world that we find ourselves. And so Rep. Leeper talked about this, um, you know, coordination with uh, Advanced CT, which um, I think is really um you know, helped to move us forward on the economic development front and to leverage um, all of our assets. But one of the things, and as we all recognize, and Representative Lieber pointed out so well, things are, I mean, the sand shifts beneath our feet daily. Um, and, you know, we are now in this new world of uh, like remote living. And, and so I guess what I'm looking to see from the economic development lens and the advanced CT is, you know, how we are positioning ourselves, you know, to compete with this uh, remote world, remote working hubs, um, you know, the 15 minute community where you live, work, play, all within the 15 minute radius. So um, I, I'm very interested to see how we are trying to develop, capitalize and promote ourselves in this way because it's an entirely new 
um, era that we're in. And it's about, you know, not stacking and packing anymore, like, you know, the metropolitan areas do. It's about quality of life. And that needs to be front and center in our economic development um, uh, platform um, as we work through this. So sorry for, you know, getting off the rail here a little bit, um, but that I think really piqued my um, my thoughts. And thanks, Rep Leeper. Um, and so uh, Rep Nuzio, I think you had your hand up. Did you not, Madam? I did, yes, thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And, and, and Commissioner, how are you? Good morning, Representative, excellent. Excellent, that's good. So um, I have a few questions. I'm not sure if it's gonna be just you or if they're gonna get spread around. So um, I'm sorry for the, the um, all over the place, but so there, there are several initiatives in here that you mentioned um, regarding eliminating inactive groups or reports. Um, is this gonna net us any savings to the budget? Um, I'd expect it to be probably nominal, but I'd like to understand what that is or if it would generate any, any um, savings. But I guess maybe the better question would be is, do we have a fiscal note for this bill? Uh, I don't believe there is a fiscal note. And I think there, there, there may be some savings, but I would expect them to be nominal. I think a lot of the savings are going to be uh, time and ultimately there could be more monetary savings, but it, it's really efficiency. Oh, of the okay, I, I kind of figured, but I, it's always good to ask the question. If, um, if there was money to save, we'd be, we'd be, we're aligned with you there. <laughs> I like that, I like that. Um, so as far as the money um, from tourism coming back to DECD, what guidelines would there be for you guys to then access and spend that money? Um, and, and if it wasn't spent, where would it end up going in the budget? Uh, I'm just, if, I, if I'm if i correct, we're kind of like a, a use it or lose it. So if they don't spend it, what's the timeline for it coming back to you? And then what's the timeline for DECD to use that? Would it be in a future, a future time period or um, the same? Sure. sure. Christine, do you want to handle that one again? Sure. Um, sorry. So yes, the, the, the time period is it would have to be returned uh, at the end of the fiscal, I believe. And the intent would be purely for it to go back into uh, media, media marketing. Um, I, again, you know, we've been hovering around 1.8, 1.9 in media at a 4.2 budget. Um, we always do our best to try to keep our media uh, at least half of our of our spend, um, but but we're really underserving that market in comparison to other states around us. So um, I would definitely uh, say that it would go right back into media to try to market the state more broadly. Would that be immediate though? Because they're sending it back to you at the end of the fiscal year. So if they're sending it back to you at the end of the fiscal year, are you in, in a, are you imagining being able to use it before the fiscal year, or would it then roll over into an additional spend in the next fiscal year? Yes. Yeah, so um, again, uh, we will have to consult the finance office, but to your point, uh, the end of the fiscal closes at June 30th. So yep. I'm not sure how nimble it will be and able to get it out of their fund and over to ours. But even if it can roll over and be applied to the start of the next fiscal year, we are still in peak tourism season and we could very quickly deploy those dollars and have effect within that current spring summer tourism campaign. Yeah, what I, what I would just add on to that is we're, we're going to be smart and pragmatic about it. So we're not going to force something that doesn't make sense just because it comes back in May. If it makes sense, if we're in the same biennium to wait until July and do something smarter, we're, we're absolutely going to do that. So I, I think there's some level of discretion, you know, within the, the marketing spend that Christine talked about that we would want, but we're, we're, go we're going to be smart and do our normal playbook. Yeah, I understand that piece of it. I think from the from the marketing perspective, I'm I'm fine with it. Like if, if it wasn't used immediately, my bigger concern is that we budget the eight point eight or the one point eight or the one point nine million, um, and then you're going to actually have more money to spend than budgeted. So that there is, a, do we have a again? I'm going to get back to the fiscal part of this. Do we have any idea how many? Um, how many dollars are left in the regional markets that may revert back to DECD and what that would look like from a budgetary perspective of the plan spend? I'm not sure if we have that data empirically. I want to make sure we give the committee a good answer. So we can we can try to look back a couple of years to say this much was not spent and, and in aggregate this has been it. Again, we don't view it as a pervasive issue. This is just a good governance issue. But yeah. if, if for some reason there's a trend there, you know, let us come to the committee with the data on that. 
I'd appreciate I that. We're not viewing this as a windfall or spending more money. We just want to make yeah. sure it's not wasted or doesn't get trapped somewhere where it could be spent less, um, you know, in a, in a way that it wasn't intended for. Yeah, definitely. And if it's a use it or lose it kind of a thing, if it comes back in, I'd, I'd just be interested to see the financials kind of flow through on that. Um, and then uh, the last uh, with the estimates, um, the estimates regarding the relocation funds, uh, that last piece there, um, were we recouping the funds in the past if somebody left within that 10 years? And, and if so, where did those dollars go? Um, and is this a change that you would expect to be permanent going forward, even though the federal dollars are um, definitely not gonna be permanent? So um, to your first question, we were recouping it when, when, when we could, um, obviously when it was a company that was viable and paid us back, we would recoup the money and that was what was expected and what was done. Um, to the extent a company did leave the state after they had a, a deal with a 10 year um, residency requirement, where that money would go, it would go back into the, if it came from the Manufacturers Assistance Act, it would go back into the revolving fund there. And that's still monies that we have access to through MAA. Um, and I want to put a finer point on this. This, this is what we're really asking for here is, is some amount of discretion, again, for very small businesses. And if there are, ever are federal funds for larger businesses above 100 employees and where state money is going to be put into these companies for some reason. And as, as this group knows, we've really dialed back the ECD's whole reliance or involvement on these incentives for the first for the first part but if we were to do it then the residency requirement would remain for those companies so this is to, to address the exception rather than the rule and give a bit more flexibility for small businesses i i totally respect that i think uh, i i love where you guys have gone with pulling back the incentives and making them more um, you know after the fact rather than before so i absolutely admire that um so if if i'm if i have all this now written down correctly any monies that would be recovered would go back into the revolving fund to be reused for something else. And the idea of this is that it's going to be um, the exception basis for small businesses. Um, and then you're gonna track it for the larger businesses um, only when there are federal funds that are available. Correct, yeah, so mo yes, correct. And then and then that is unlikely we're gonna be getting a lot of federal funds. So it's mo the <laughs> yeah. requirement will most likely remain for if we do this with bigger businesses. Okay, thank you very much. Those are my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rep. Nuccio. And Madam Chair, I, I apologize. I have a 11 o'clock appointment, but you're in excellent hands, arguably better hands with Glenn Thames than with me. So I will talk to this committee soon. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, Rep. Thomas, uh, for the second time. Yes, thank you so much for the indulgence. I had forgotten one question, but I saw DECD did submit um, testimony on SB 623. Six, um, about establishing a new enterprise zone. I, uh, I know we'll hear from some others later today, but I had a concern about, you know, it's almost like spot enterprise zoning. <laughs> um, and, and I'm just curious about the uh, commission's uh, thoughts about, it just seemed like a slippery slope to name one specific town. Um, it seemed a bit arbitrary just address that or your thoughts and concerns? Yes, thank you, um, Representative. I, you're spot on with your per perception of the, the issue, if you will. Um, so there is uh, enabling legislation that allows for the implementation of enterprise zones. And so GECD manages this process. We have an application criteria that set forth and established by state statute. And so this, when this popped up, our antennas immediately went up because again, setting that precedent of, to your point, spot uh, identifying enterprise zones versus kind of circumventing the process, if you will. So um, from our perspective, you know, again, I think there needs to be a broader look at the enterprise zone legislation if there was, you know, desired changes by the legislature versus taking this kind of ad hoc approach. That was really the intent of the testimony we provided. Thank you for that. Um, and just to clarify, is I would assume if we adopted one particular town such as this, that would open a threshold for a certain number of others to make a similar claim. Are you afraid of this sort of slippery slope that um, basically render many more towns uh, eligible, if you will, like too many towns? 
Yeah, I think it's it's not, it is a slippery slope, but I don't think it's a matter of too many towns. I think it's the right times, right? And what, okay. what, what are you basing that criteria for the impact, right? What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the, you know, impact you're trying to have and how are you using this as incentive? And that's not going to be everybody, right? By yeah. design. Exactly. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Madam Chair, for the second <laughs> time. Uh, yes, thanks, Rep. Thompson. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Thames, can you just give us a thumbnail on the history of the Enterprise Zone? Because um, it has existed for a while, and then, you know, there's been a retrenchment, and uh, then we had a situation with East Hartford. Can you just walk us through uh, briefly that chronology and where yeah. we are? Okay. Right. So the enterprise legislation, as you laid out, has been around for uh, quite some time. Um, and so we have a dedicated team that works on certification, you know, and recertification. There's been times where there's been funding, funding allocated, not allocated or what have you. But we still have a dedicated resource and team that are working through the annual certifications and applications for enterprise. Zone. So it's still very much an active program. Um, if you want any further details, uh, I can absolutely uh, provide that. Um, so just um, recent history, uh, there was a budget, and I'm trying to think back, maybe 2017 or thereabouts, which um, basically um, removed the state participation. I mean, the program is that uh, a, designate, a zone gets designated and then there are tax incentives um, and there essentially is, um, you know, a hold harmless to the towns. The state provides um, uh, resources to um, protect the town from offering those uh, tax incentives. Is that correct? Correct. That's the general uh, gist of the program. It's a tax abatement uh, program. So to the extent that your community is certified as an enterprise zone, you get uh, a certain percentage of tax rebate uh, from the state. And then the state, uh, and I once again, I, I'm not remembering the exact year. Uh, it goes back probably three or four years ago. Uh, it stopped uh, participating, if you will, in the program, which then left municipalities with the um, uh, the the burden of um, not being held harmless, uh, so to speak, for those tax abatements, is that correct? Yes, my understanding that there was some budgetary. Um, again, it was just before my time, but my understanding is that there was some budgetary issues there. George Northley, I know, is on from the team as well here. Um, George, I, I don't know, do you want to just give, up, give us that historical um, uh, framework? Good morning. Um, I would basically be seconding uh, what uh, Commissioner Thames uh, just uh, um, um, commented on, which is that historically there was an 80-20 split uh, in, in terms of uh, funding between uh, the state and the municipality. Um, there has been uh, some issue with regard to those funds being matched going forward. Um, there are very few um, enterprise zones, to my knowledge, at this point in time across the state that are all fully engaged in participating from the municipality side. So we will need from the department um, a brief synopsis of the history of the enterprise zone. Um, and the status of where it is right now. Sure, no problem, happy to do that. And, and, and yeah, if you could get that to us sooner than later, that would be very helpful. Yep, and I believe we outlined some of that in our testimony, but we will make sure we give you a comprehensive uh, historical analysis and kind of state of play currently. Yeah, and, and, and I'm interested in obviously the state's participation, which then speaks to holding municipalities harmless for this, you know, tax abatement. So, um, and, and, you know, is it currently funded in the budget is, or is the program um, uh, shuttered, so to speak, so that we are 
continuing to do those reimbursements um, for those that are in the program but are not taking new um, new towns or, or or zones on, so to speak. I mean, we, we just need you know a clear update where we are on. No problem. Happy to do that. Thank you, um, uh, Senator Martin. I, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to be clear, uh, you know, I am a one of the introducers of, the, of this uh, proposal, this bill, along with Representative Whit Betts, and uh, there was no clear, in, there was no intent on our, uh, from us to circumvent any process here. So I wanted to make that uh, clear to everybody. We were asked by the economic development director of the town of Plymouth since the community Plymouth is surrounded by municipalities, Thomaston, Bristol in particular, uh, by, uh, by enterprise zones communities that they felt they're here, here they are sort of in a donut hole and they were being ex, uh, somewhat, why would we not be able to uh, be classified as an enterprise community? So therefore the, the, the bill was introduced now. Regarding el eligibility, um, I, I understand that there's 10 different enterprise zones, uh, you know, look at, starting from manufacturing to, to uh, uh, I guess Bradley has a, a designated zone. We had the bio zone that Bristol, bioscience that Bristol is part of not only that one, but also a manufacturing zone. So there's a corridor zone for that along with uh, a continuous, you know, municipality zone, et cetera. So I, I see that from the DECD's website that the eligibility is you got to meet a certain criteria. And I guess I, I'm a little confused as to is that those eligibility, are they different in each of the zones or is that applicable towards all all of zones. Yeah, so I think so. You, so your point, uh, Senator Market Martin, and thank you for your remarks because I know a lot of times it's not anyone's intent, and that's why we just wanted to make sure we were having a dialogue and people understood, again, the the process, um, if you will. Um, but you know, to your point, there are you know uh, pursuant legislation, the air the airport zones, the enterprise zones. There's uh, the bio corridor zones, there's a lot of different zones that have been on the statutes and on the books for quite some time. And I think personally, since I've gotten here, we're still trying to wrap our <laughs> arms around all of them, um, if you will. But they are uh, unique to some extent um, and have distinctions relative to kind of what qualifies what. So we're happy to provide you, again, like the detail behind all those zones and how we administer them at the agency as a follow up. So Glenn, are you saying that each of those zones have different criteria in order to qualify? Well, there's some broad based there's some broad based uh, criteria, but I think based off of again, if you're in an airport zone, there is some unique you know criteria based on that uh, zone, uh, if you will. But again, I will get you all of that detailed information. I, I guess I'm looking, you know. Um, for the qualifications that are on your the main page here, uh, it seems like um, it's a little ambiguous, a little bit in regards to gee, are, it, are you taking statistics based on the whole town versus, or are you you carve out a specific area of the town, and therefore, if those eligibility requirements are, I guess, applicable to that area that's been carved out versus the whole town, those are two different numbers that you would come up with. Yes, you're correct. So, you know, if you had a distressed municipality that qualified for enterprise zone, there could be just a portion of, or a, you know, a specific two streets or whatever that were deemed the enterprise zone. So there is, you know, a level of, you know, detail that goes into the process. But again, I'm happy to provide that level of detail and work with the team. So I'm not talking totally out of school. No, 
Okay, thank you, Glenda. It's, you know, I think we can talk offline regarding this and regarding uh, Plymouth uh, being, you know, what does it need to do to qualify in order to be included in the enterprise zone? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Senator Martin. Um, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Um, Madam Clerk, am I missing anything? Uh, um, no. Okay, so if I could just briefly um, kind of do some circle back uh, on the dry cleaning fund, um, you, it was indicated that there, there is times when, or that they have to, as a matter of course, use some of the money out of the fund to pay the legal expenses. Um, and I would be interested to know uh, what was taken out of the fund, how often does that happen? Legal expenses, um, uh, you know, you do have in-house counsel. In fact, I think we're graced with his attendance um, actually during this hearing this morning. So I'm wondering why we've got that expense um, and maybe you could come back to us with that. Um, and then uh, with regard to, you know, the cleanup of the annual report, because yes, your annual report is very important. Um, and, and I do appreciate the, um, <laughs> you know, the, the history here where, where the auditors have, you know, dinged you on, on certain parts of that. What I would like is um, a uh, itemization of your deletion, the reports that you're asking um, to be deleted from your annual report, um, and then, you know, the department. Okay, I know, for example, DOL is one of them. And you don't have the accountability for doing some of the, you know, the job um, numbers or the employment numbers. So we need the list of those things that you are deleting and then what correlating department, because I think it was to, I don't know, Rep. Thomas or one of our colleagues here who said, you know, we don't want to be creating a situation where we've got blackouts on uh, reporting and yet we don't want to hold, you know, hold you all responsible for those areas that, you know, you don't have the oversight for. OK. Um, and then um, lastly, uh, on the res on the, the resident, the change on the residency uh, on the 10 year requirement. So that specifically would translate into SBX. And then you said as federal funds come Are any other programs that that would apply to. That's pretty much the, the focus, the target. Okay. And on SBX, again, what what's the reason for that? I mean, you know, we're making investments. It, it isn't unusual that we have some kind of, you know, uh, longevity commitment associated with that. I mean, small business, you're talking businesses under 100 employees. What's your what's your definition? So we're using the Small Business Express definition of businesses that have less, 100 or less employees. And again, this is really a very narrow point where we're just trying to provide some discretion. So for example, when we were going through, you know, in the height of the COVID crisis and we're administering, you know, uh, several uh, hundred uh, dollar grants, um, particularly with the Federal CARES Act dollars, where we're now upwards of 10,000 businesses that receive grants, this relocation clause, um, again, was something that kind of hamstrung us to some ability because we're now providing $5,000 grant using federal dollars while still holding businesses to this 10-year non-relocation requirement, which seems a little bit unreasonable. Um, so again, it was examples like that, that really kind of, you know, uh, lights went off and said, you know, we probably should have some discretion, particularly in these unique circumstances. Uh, okay, so it's on a case by case basis. It's not just a carte blanche. Exactly, or, uh, exactly. Yeah. Hey, yeah, okay. Because the other part of that is, I mean, I get it for the $2,000 grants and so forth. Um, you know, maybe you have a dollar threshold. I, yeah, that's a conversation that we can have. If if that's gonna, you know, help everybody feel comfortable, I I think we'll be more than open to that conversation. Okay. Yeah, and and you know, on that point, I mean, 
when you all were sharing your numbers, and by the way, once again, kudos to Glenn Yu and the team and the commissioner, um, because I know, you know, this was like a 24 seven operation here for, for all of you. Um, but one of my frustrations was that, um, you know, when you did the direct grants, we couldn't get any data on, you know, who that went out to. And I, and I understand it was just a direct payment, you know, triggered through DRS. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, put the footnote on it that even those, it's important for us to know um, who we're reaching and, and what the landscape is. So, yeah, so, so to that point, uh, Senator, so we have the data for the 10,000, you know, uh, $5,000 grants to uh, small businesses. We have data and I believe we provided that and want to make sure you have that. And then also on the small business recovery grant that you're referencing, where we partnered with DRS, there wasn't an application. We just kind of used our eligibility criteria and kind of uh, self-identify businesses that fit that box based on next codes, uh, wages, and, and what have you, um, and sent out, you know, close to or just over 2,000 um, grants to businesses with an average of 15K. We have geographical data, we have the industry data. Um, so we do have a certain level of data that we can provide and we are happy to share that with you. Yeah, um, okay. It, it's helpful just so that, you know, we really uh, can understand, you know, who we're reaching again. Um, so I, I don't see um, any uh, additional questions. Um, so with that, I would say thanks to uh, uh, the commission, deputy commissioner, commissioner um, and, and, and the team for being with us. And so we will await the responses on some of the things that we've identified uh, earlier today. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. Kyle will follow up with Ginger on all those responses. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, folks. To be continued. Um, we at this point will uh, move on. And the next person who um, will be with us is Senator Paul Formica. Senator Formica. I know I saw you. Oh, there you are. Uh, good morning, good, Madam Chair. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Chairs Hartley and Simmons, ranking members Martin and Buckby, and distinguished members of the Commerce Committee. I'm Senator Paul Formican here to speak in favor of Committee Bill 430, an act concerning Regional Tourism District Board of Directors. This is a simple fix, uh, as it simply puts uh, the intention to open more direct communication of the arts, culture, and tourism industry and to ease the communication burden for the tourism district and for some of the small towns that are its members. Many small communities are volunteer challenged and being able to have one person represent a few towns would allow for better access to information and for the districts to then have an easier time to meet their quorum uh, requirements. The arts, culture and tourism industry as this committee well knows is a statewide job producer and revenue driver for our great state. And I thank you very much for, for considering this very important opportunity uh, that would help our districts and small towns. Um, additionally, in relating to the earlier conversation with DECD, I would be in favor of the release of excess funds of the $400,000 that are pro provided to the districts at the end of the year if unused, uh, only if they would be then directed to statewide marketing uh, and not other programs. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few minutes with your committee, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate your, your testimony. Thanks for being with us today and uh, for, for all your leadership on, on tourism. And, um, you know, wondering if you could talk about what you've seen in, you know, Eastern Connecticut, you know, from your perspective as a, as a small business owner in terms of the, the impact of, of tourism in, in your region and, and what you're seeing. Well, well, tourism is a huge driver in Eastern Connecticut. It, it, it's a big driver in many other portions of the state but simply with our uh, vast resources of, uh, you know, inland trails and farmland and parks and, and, uh, and also our, our seacoast, uh, we have a great opportunity 
uh, to provide many opportunities for people to come here. We have many museums. Um, we have many opportunities for people to come and then top that with the two greatest resort casinos in the world. And, and we have, you know, we have a driver for it. I believe that this underlying economy is stronger than you know, we saw coming out of the last great recession. And I think as soon as uh, people feel safe to do so, uh, the economy is going to explode with not only uh, visitors from outside our state, but I think we're going to do quite well with staycations, people going back and forth across the state. I've talked to this committee before about that. Um, and I think people are just going to take advantage of the beautiful weather and the beautiful opportunities we have here. Um, and as far as the tourism industry goes, you know, we need to reestablish confidence and we need to fill those hotels up, which in turn will have a trickle down effect on all of the great attractions that we have in the restaurants and the hospitality industry that so depends on that. Great, Th thank you, Senator, for that answer. And I uh, wanted to open up to my colleagues. Any questions from committee members? Uh, Senator Martin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Formica, just very quickly regarding the, the um, allowing two or more municipalities in the region to uh, sort of appoint one representative. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on regarding that, it, you know, I, this bill came to us last year, if I'm not mistaken, we may have heard it. And I think even the uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Heather Summers made, uh, I had a discussion with her regarding the lack of individuals because of, you know, the, you know, it's a volunteer board basically, but can you just tell us a little bit so that the committee knows what's going on? Thank you. So the, the Eastern, district, for example, I think has 60 some odd towns. Many of them are up in, uh, say, Senator Austin's district, which, you know, uh, Sprague and, and those small towns are unable to um, field one uh, district member for each town consistently. And, and the failure of those towns to provide attendance, and I'm not just speaking to Senator Austin's town, just using her small town district as an example. Um, but the failure of those folks to attend the district meeting results in, in sometimes not having quorums for the district to then conduct its business. And so by having smaller towns regionalize, if you will, around one representative, uh, even a rotating representative that could go there and then come back and report to two or three towns or four towns, uh, you know, because their tourism uh, impact up in that part may not have the same level of interest and the same impact as Mystic or uh, some of the other towns, um, you know, that, that are more geared toward tourism. So that's really the simple intent of this bill is just to allow business to go forward with the district and still maintain uh, proper communication amongst the small towns, whether it's in the Eastern District or some towns in the Western District may have the same uh, need to, to provide representative, you know, representation from, you know, one person for a few towns. Okay. Thank, thank you, Senator Formica. Thank, thank you, Senator Martin. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions from committee members? Seeing none. Thank you, Senator Formica. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Give my best to the, I'll be there. I haven't seen him in a long time, so. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Will, will do. You too. Thanks so much. Okay, so now that the first hour is up, we will be alternating from uh, public officials uh, to members of the public. So um, next, I believe, Madam Clerk, correct me if I'm wrong, we have Seth Duke. That is correct. Great. Seth, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'm the Economic Development Commissioner in Plymouth, as well as uh, my day job is I'm the, the Chief Marketing Officer for ONG Industries. Um, I'm here to talk about the, the bill that Henry Martin presented. And first, I want to apologize. We weren't trying to circumvent the process. But one of the challenges we're having is that we do get a lot of prospects to our business park, which is about 50% empty right now. We have 11 lots remaining. But what we're finding is because we're in the donut hole, if they're looking at the region, we're just as disadvantaged in terms of education and um, employment and things like that as the towns around us. 
but they have a, a huge advantage to us in being able to offer that program. We were just looking for a way that perhaps we can, perhaps legislation can be changed so that they will look at us as, as part of the corridor because I have noticed some corridor programs. Um, you know, like we would qualify along a Route 8 corridor. We would also qualify, you know, through the region as a corridor too, as all the towns around us are um, enterprise zones. But really, we're just looking for a way to level the playing field because right now we are at a disadvantage in, in relation to towns around us. Um, are, are there questions I can answer from the committee, perhaps? Thank you very much, Seth, for your uh, your testimony and, and for being so so concise and uh, uh, lay, laying out the key points. We, we appreciate it. Uh, let me open it up. Any questions from committee members? Seeing none, Seth, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, actually, we do have one question. Senator Martin. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Very, very quickly. Hi, Seth, thank you for hey, coming. Henry. Uh, thank you for coming in and clarifying mm -hmm. that the, the intent uh, was not to circumvent the, uh, the process here. I think we're all sort of learning a little bit more about the enterprise zone. Uh, and I know that you've made some attempts to contact DCD in the hopes that we can uh, have a discussion with them. And uh, I'd hope to, uh, that we can uh, collectively meet with them so that we can have a better understanding of what that application process uh, is and what the requirements are, in particular with the eligibility requirements regarding poverty levels, et cetera. Because I know that the town of Plymouth is an alliance district, if I'm not mistaken, and would qualify for, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, on, because of that alone, you know, makes it sort of a a community that is uh, needs some some help. So, nonetheless, so just wanted to thank you for for yeah. coming. And if you want to speak to that a little bit, that's, that's yeah. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, Henry. You know, I've been very involved in, in economic economic development in the Waterbury area, and you know, I understand the different challenges and and you know, Torrington and Bridgeport as well. Um, one of the things I see is that the smaller towns tend to get overlooked, even though their their numbers are the same in terms of poverty, poverty in terms of unemployment, just because obviously everybody's going after the bigger the bigger fish and the bigger targets. But I, I think there might be a way for legislation to also help out some of the smaller towns. You know, like I said, we, we get a lot of prospects at our door. The one challenge we always have is closing because you know towns like Brit uh, Brit not to their fault, but Bristol, Waterbury have these programs where they can lure them away. So it's just another tool for us to be able to level the playing field. And quite honestly, you know, fill a park that the ECD is, is helping us fund. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Seth. That's appreciated. Thanks, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Martin. Any other questions from committee members? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Seth. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So next we have, I don't believe Neil is with us. Um, so, next, so next we have Mayor Pete Hess. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I'm trying my lost my video button here to flick on, but I'll just, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, well, first of all, to the members of the committee, um, thank you for allowing me to uh, speak today on behalf of Senate Bill 1020. Um, you know, first of all, um, Naugatuck and Waterbury, we got the message loud and clear from Hartford that working together regionally, it, you know, is better, it's encouraged, and you should try and do it when you can. So. Uh, Mayor O'Leary and I talk often. So we had a, a project that he was working on in Waterbury um, that borders Naugatuck. And together we came up with the notion that if we purchase land together jointly, combined it with his property in Waterbury and allowed access to the property through Naugatuck, we could have a, a very successful large project that would benefit both towns. We went to DECD, we were greeted with open arms because we were working together and the project is going along great and you know we're about to move forward with the developer. But we 
experience firsthand the benefits of, of working together on a regional concept. So we decided to form um, a new entity, NVRDC, Naugatuck Valley Regional Development Corp, which is starting off as a partnership between Naugatuck and Waterbury, but will be opened up to um, surrounding towns so that we can uh, continue to grow and have even more of a, a regional base. Um, we've got a lot of really exciting projects. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what's going on with the Waterbury branch line, but, um, but you've already invested close to $100 million in signalization, positive train control, and the crossings so that we can convert um, our train line into a real commuter line. You know, you may not know this, but you could only have one way traffic on the Waterbury branch line until these improvements are completed and they're almost complete. So we're gonna have a real commuter line. And, and think of it like this, look what happened in Danbury when they had a real commuter line and a line where you could go somewhere and actually get back. And when we have that in the Valley, things are just gonna open up. And you know, you know, you may say, why the Valley? Well, the answer is really simple. If you took a drone and flew from Waterbury to Bridgeport down the train line, you would see raw land, flat land, right on the rail line, ready to be developed. And what you can't see but you can hear from the words of myself, Mayor O'Leary, and every leader, every mayor, first selectman along the line, is that we have investors and projects that are, are ready to go. And, and, and that's what the state needs. You know, it's great to improve service everywhere, but when you create something where you can actually grow and bring in new development, new citizens living here, new opportunities, you're creating new revenue, which is really, really a good thing for the budget. So, so we've got great opportunity. We also have another large project. I'm not gonna go into depth on it, but it's a freight rail project, which is a huge project, which can create connections for Connecticut um, not just regionally, not just statewide, throughout New England, Canada, and internationally. And we have other projects and, and other people in our area have projects. So we're coming out of COVID, you know, it's, it's a great, great time. We're all feeling progress, we're feeling momentum. And, you know, we're looking for a little, a little jump start. So um, we've taken um, the step of together um, we've hired Tommy Hyde, he's our director, and um, we're trying to find a way to, you know, to jumpstart our project, to bring more people into it, and to have a regional entity that can be more effective and um, have a little more leverage. And, you know, Naugatuck is stronger when we work with um, Waterbury I see Kara Rochelle's picture right above, uh, you know, in her town down in Ansonia. They'll be stronger if they work with us. So when we all work together, we're stronger, we're more effective. It's what the state wants. Um, so we're, we've taken the message and um, we really want to implement it. So um, this is a, a great bill that is a, you know, a small investment with a very large bang for the buck with, with what's going to happen and what's going to come in the Valley. And um, I really believe, you know, that I say the gold is in the Valley. The opportunity is here. There's more raw land and we're ready to go. We have a great location, probably the best location in Connecticut from a centrality standpoint. And we're here ready and we're asking for a little help and uh, jump start. So with that, I'll um, open it up for questions. 
Um, thank you very much, Mayor Hess, um, uh, for being with us this morning and also um, for uh, helping to craft this very novel proposal. Um, you know, as, as I look at it, um, and you stress the regional piece of this, there's a couple of, I think, really important um, parts of this that really resonate with where we are now as a state. Um, one certainly is the regional aspect. Um, we, we recognize the fact that Connecticut uh, strength is in collaborating and, and presenting and working um, as, uh, you know, putting districts together. That was most demonstrated not that long ago when the Amazon headquarter bidding war was going on. There was over 200 different um, bidders coming in on that. We were one of those in the state of Connecticut. And, you know, we recognize the fact that if we did not um, participate or represent ourselves in regions, then we weren't really in, uh, you know, in play. And, and, and that's what we first started to do. So this is a continuation of that. But to your point, Mayor Hess, this um, is relative to a particular um, corridor of Connecticut, which has to date been underserved in a number of ways, but so with so much untapped potential. I mean, the COD points out to us that the uh, that corridor, that Naugatuck corridor, where the branch line serves, which you referenced, uh, serves about a quarter of a million people. Um, and has about 2,200 businesses. Now, by putting together this regional entity, um, we build on our strength. And so right now, you mentioned that Naugatuck and Waterbury were the two uh, municipalities, towns that um, have come together with this NVRDC. But the legislation talks about uh, meeting certain thresholds, one of which is a minimum number of towns and also talks about um, leveraging um, local dollars. In other words, this is not a request for an outright um, grant. This is a, a request for leveraging or, or matching. Can, can you speak to those two points, the, so I'm understanding that there's probably gonna be an initiative to bring on other towns to this uh, development um, model. And that also there is um, do local dollars, which will be um, uh, offered for development projects um, and looking for some kind of participation match from the state. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it is true. We're asking for a, a matching contribution um, with limits. Uh, I think it's a reasonable request. Um, we're going to have skin in the game, um, both towns, and um, we're going to be putting up lots of municipal money in Naugatuck um, for our projects. So for, for at least in our case, for both projects, and I believe uh, the same is true in Waterbury with Mayor O'Leary. Um, as far as growing, um, we are, you know, we're, we're just forming. Um, we, um, we're at our very early stages. We're a, a brand new company. Um, we've just brought on an executive director. Um, we intend to grow, we will grow. I think it'll be quite quickly. Um, but the only reason we haven't grown so far is we, we just started. We're, we're really right out of the gate. Um, and I think we're right out of the gate at a perfect time. Um, you know, um, I know that, you know, uh, even pre-COVID, I think it was the perfect time. And now with COVID, it seems to be enhanced. Um, you know, you can't, you can't buy a house in Naugatuck today. There they're, they're not, there's none for sale. They, they're going crazy. So this is the time to really jump on this and, 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 and get a real jump start and get these projects uh, going and, um, and just get the growth, get a catalyst and boom, we're off. So 
I think, you know, I said it the best way. I think that this area, the Waterbury branch line, this bill, and I'm going to say the Port of Naugatuck, other projects in Waterbury are ripe. The time is perfect. And um, other towns in the valley um, have the same opportunities. And, you know, in the valley, you know, we all get along well. We, uh, you know, at our Naugatuck Valley COG, 19 towns, we never argue about anything. We find a common solution and a problem. We're going to do that with NVRDC. And um, um, we think this will set a good example for other parts of the state to become more regional, work together, and um, move Connecticut forward. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hess. And so uh, when we're talking about regional, we are specifically talking about economic development in terms of um, a regional model. N nothing, it would not transcend into other kinds of things. Uh, for example, uh, education. Correct. It's only for economic development projects exclusively. It's an econ NVRDC. It's an economic development um, body that um, is two towns right now and will grow. But our sole mission is economic development in our region. Thank you, Mayor Hess, for clarifying that. And one last question, if I might, and that is, so how would you answer or re the response to, um, well, why would you need legislation to do this? Why can't you just do this on your own? All right, I'm gonna answer that and I'm gonna go back to where you were on the enterprise zones. So in Naugatuck, I could tell you this, we're an enterprise corridor zone. The state stopped funding us three years ago. I don't really know why, but I can tell you that it happened and um, we're not getting that money. So we're, we're left on our own. Um, we're working on our own. Um, and, you know, we're asking for, for a little help, um, you know, and in our enterprise zone, it, I could tell you who can get, you know, who's eligible. It's for manufacturing. It's for our industrial park. It's for, companies with, with certain codes. It's very specific as to who qualifies, but um, we were left, now we're funding that program completely instead of the 80-20 you know, arrangement. It was actually 80-60, 40-20, year plan. Um, it's gone, it's not funded. So, you know, we're, we, we can use the jumpstart. You know, I think the Waterbury branch line is the best thing in the world for us. And this will help us get our, our projects going and, and help us move forward. Um, you know, the valley is, is uh, most of the towns are distressed municipalities. Um, and, uh, but I will say this, we're gritty, we're tough, we're resilient, and you give us a chance and we'll make you proud. Guarantee it. I don't doubt it, Mayor Hess, at all. Um, uh, uh, Representative Rochelle. I think you have your hand up. I do, and thank you so much, Chair Hartley. You've touched on so many of the, the, the questions I wanted to ask because uh, you're so thorough and I, I, I just love the collaboration that we have uh, happening in the Valley around this. Uh, so I wanted to first and foremost praise uh, Mayor Hess for his initiative on this. Uh, he's always been somebody who has been, um, you know, ahead of the curve and really pushing, uh, had vision on things like the Port of Naugatuck, had vision, uh, you know, hearing what the state is saying about regional, regional uh, regionalization of resources. This is really an initiative that is responsive to the state and, and, will, and will truly leverage. Um, I represent Ansonia and Derby, which are the, the first and fifth most economically distressed in the state. And so, um, you know, when, when Senator Hartley says, you know, how will this help us? Um, you know, we do need this leverage. We, we can't do it alone. Uh, if you want to go far, you go together. And this is um, just a wonderful piece of legislation uh, and, and, and exactly at the right time. Uh, and I say that because uh, as, as Mayor Hess often says, the goal is in the Valley. Uh, we have 12.3 million square feet of developable land available in our transportation oriented development zone specifically. And um, I do want to apologize, Senator Hartley does not include Waterbury. I don't have the figure for Waterbury proper. This is just for Naugatuck through Derby. 
uh, through those stations. Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of land um, that is available for redevelopment. We have our, the, the governor put the train line in, increases in our, in the, the budget this year. So we're looking at increased service. We're looking at uh, a lot of development activity and we need the resources as, as small but mighty towns to work together to get this development done um, properly. So thank you so much for all that you do, Mayor Hess. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Rochelle. Um, uh, Senator Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mayor Hess, I love you. I Every time I've met you from day one, uh, I love your enthusiasm. I love the way that you talk about the Valley and you're a very positive individual as to the potential of what the Valley could be uh, to the area in its overall development, um, but how well you speak of your your town and your area of the state. So thank you. Uh, just a few things. Uh, first of all, I like the idea of the two communities, Waterbury and Naugatuck, collaborating together to say, hey, listen, we've got, if we get together, we can do something positive here. And that is the economic development of our uh, that will be beneficial to both the community. So I like that aspect. I don't like forced uh, regionalization, but I I am a one for opening up as many doors as possible to allow communities, municipalities to have discussions to what, gee, what can we do collectively uh, so that we can improve the efficiencies of our area, including economic development. So with that said, Pete, uh, the other aspect I like about this as well is the skin in the game. And I think you've heard me mention that when we had a, uh, you know, talking about the rail line up in the, uh, uh, I think it was in Naugatuck, right? It's in your community that we had a meeting uh, with the DOT. Uh, I want to say it was a year ago. It could have been a year and a half. It's hard to tell. Remember with COVID uh, being interjected in, into all this. But I like the fact of, of the, your the communities coming up with money and not just looking to the state for a sort of a handout. So with, with that, can you mentioned also, you know, it's sort of beginning with you and Waterbury, and then you're looking to ask other municipalities to participate in this. How are you going to determine how much each of the municipalities are going to contribute? Have you had those discussions yet? Because I, I think I was, was it Tom Hyde? He, you know, he and I have had a discussion and it sounds like you guys have already have an existing pool of money. And I don't know that who's that, who that is coming from, but how will other communities participate and what, how do, are, are their required funding going to be determined? Right. So it hasn't, all been ironed out yet as far as the new communities but like for example um you know Naugatuck is approximately one third the size of Waterbury so um you know just for basic budgeting purposes we're basically talking one third two thirds with Waterbury you know if we added a small town like say Beacon Falls you know proportionately pro rata you know, just from a population standpoint, you know, they would, you know, from what they would add by way of, you know, payments would be proportionate and small. Um, as far as, you know, if they had a project that, and let's just say in Beacon Falls, and it was a great project, um, our entire team, you know, NVRDC, would be advocating for their project. They would have to come up with, you know, their match from their town. Um, but, um, you know, that's basically how it would work. So, you know, the smaller towns, as far as what they pay us or, you know, what they pay for dues would be small based on population. But if they have a great project, um, we would get behind that project and, you um, try and help them, you know, attain that project. And, um, you know, having said that, we're still, you know, looking for the, the best way to do this, the best way to leverage things, but it's all with the notion that we recognize that we have to have skin in the game 
We do have skin in the game. We're making significant investments um, now and, and going forward. Um, you know, in Naugatuck, it's going to be uh, public-private partnerships. Um, you know, everything is going to be that way. The town will be involved. You know, the state helps us with remediation. Um, the private entity will, will make the, you know, obviously the largest contribution. And we look to the state to help us on, you know, certain smaller aspects that, that can get us, you know, get the project going. So it'll be a combination of funds. Every project will be different. Um, but um, I think the key is to, is to get it started, uh, get the impetus going, get the excitement going. And, and have it grow. I mean, think of it like you could live in Naugatuck, work in Stanford, or vice versa. You know, you, if you have a real commuter line, you know, let, let me say this for those of you that aren't familiar with the Waterbury Branch Line. In its heyday, you could leave Naugatuck and go somewhere, New York City or anywhere, but you might not get back. So whatever success the line had it was you know based on the fact that it was never a real commuter line now that we're going to have a reliable commuter line that people can use for work and to get back and forth to work and even to go go out for a show and know you can get back it's going to bring a lot more to every project you know i used to say in Naugatuck we could do a great project right now, but with the Waterbury Branch Line, it'll be a sensational project. And we're looking for sensational and um, we're growing and it's everything is uh, a, a combination of funds, public private partnerships and uh, regional. And, you know, I think we're doing it the right way. And, um, you know, we're open to guidance to make it better. We're, uh, we, we want to have, we want progress and we think we have the best place for it. To, to the committee, can you, can you see why I love the guy? He is just so good at promoting his, uh, this idea as well as the uh, area. Uh, Pete, uh, uh, what type of funding to match are you looking from the state? Is it a two to one, three to one, four to one? So in other words, if you guys put in a million dollars collectively. Um, well, it's in the bill. I, it's, um... I, I don't have the bill in front of me here now, um, but um, we're yeah, um, five million in here. It says five million in here, and uh, there's a little bit for any. It says no applicant shall receive more than five million for any single proposed economic development program. So it's a little ambiguous as to what that exactly means. Well, I think, I think what we're looking for is a one-to-one -one match. So if you gave. Uh, if the state put up a um, million dollars for a project in Naugatuck, Naugatuck would match it with a million dollars. Okay. Um, so let's go back a little bit to, I know you still have some details to be worked out, but if you're, in, if you're asking other smaller communities to participate and let's say you guys have a million dollars and you're uh, sort of a third was to you, uh, two thirds was Waterbury. The smaller com com uh, communities would proportionately give their monies into this pool. Well, hold on, hold on. I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I hope I didn't give that impression. So we're we're going to operate as a group, but each project is going to be a separate project. So if Beacon Falls had a project, um, uh, you know, they would have to put up money um, for their project. Now, once we get going mm -hmm. and we, we have funding and, you know, we have, a, a, you know, a, a pot of money, so to speak, to hand out, then it will be allocated and it will be... Um, you know, done in whatever rules we implement, whatever, um, whatever we finalize with the new towns, but we want the projects to work. Um, so we'll find a way to, to make them work. We're, we're really trying to, excuse me, 
to leverage um, the situation and get more funding, knowing that we're going to have private partners and some matching state money and local money and NVRDC money. Okay, so hang on one second, please. Thank you. So it sounds so, like you, you want- Hold on one second. I, um, I'm just gonna, um, so the funding would come from existing loan programs and the municipalities would pay a fee to join and then get access to a larger pool of funding is how it's being structured by our um, advisors. Can you repeat that, Pete, one more time? I'm sorry. Yeah. The funding is coming from existing loan programs. The municipalities would be paying a fee to hmm. join, and then they would get access to a larger pool of funding. Sorry, I missed that. How much, how much is in that pool of money currently? And, it, and um, it, we would be matching the funding from the state. So um, there'd be a pool somewhere in the $3 million range, and that would be available for projects, which we would match the contribution from the state. So if you guys come up with 3 million, then you're looking for the state for the one-to-one -one ratio of $3 million. So you have 6 million, and then you guys, this, this uh, regional, I guess, development program board would issue based on the project and participation from a municipality determine how much they'd be allocating to the project. Yes, and I will, I will say that- um, It could be a loan I, fee I, or a grant. I was just gonna say that I would defer to Mayor O'Leary on, um, on some of the refined points of this in the sense that he's in charge and um, he was expected to testify today. Um, I guess I'm an expert on, on, on the big picture. And as far as the details, um, I would defer to him. I believe he will be here. Um, but what I said is the thumbnail sketch of, of what we've discussed so far. Sure. Pete, I know that there are probably others that have some questions. I just want to uh, just remind you the, the measures, you know, like if we do do this and it's a one-to-one -one match or one-to-two or whatever the, the ratio is, but the importance of, of showing the economic development that has actually taken place once this program is off and running you know, and going forward. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Martin, um, for your um, explicit questions. Um, and Mayor Hess, um, it's very uh, intriguing to talk about this because it, as I understand this, this is a totally new model that doesn't exist hitherto for. And I think um, that's kind of where we are now um, about you know, being a creative, responding to situations and leveraging. And this kind of, as I said earlier, seems to check all those boxes, public, private, you know, voluntary uh, collaboration between communities um, and, and leveraging um, our, our very um, precious and challenging resources. So I don't see any other questions, um, any other hands raised. Um, and seeing none, I, I want to thank Mayor Hess for being with us because I know he has got a very a demanding schedule. So thank you. Um, and um, uh, Madam Clerk, I believe we uh, will be moving on to our sign up list. And uh, Sheila O'Malley uh, is not with us. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so um, uh, Kathy Saint, um, who is a representative from the CMC, which is the Connecticut Manufacturing Collaborative. Um, Kathy, are you with us? Hey, good, Hi. what is afternoon? No, yeah, not yet. Yes, it is, good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, it was all very interesting. And I'm uh, uh, being a manufacturer and here, a lot of my customers in the Valley and everything that 
I, I was very impressed with the mayor's testimony and all that's going on there with the show's initiative. Um, thank you very much to the committee and the General Assembly for um, hearing us today and also for all the work that you've been doing for quite some time to support manufacturers in Connecticut. I'm speaking in favor of the um, Raised Bill 1021, an act establishing manufacturing technology working group. And um, I think that what you'll see is um, some common threads in a lot of the manufacturing related proposals that are coming through the legislature this session and last um, that led to our um, chief manufacturing officer and to the creation of the CMC. And this is just another logical uh, step in the direction of breaking down the silos and um, getting all the different organizations that provide tremendously valuable resources to manufacturers here in Connecticut. Um, some I, uh, some better context as far as their own driving lanes, where they intersect and how they can support each other without stepping on their toes. And at the end of the day, present a very clear um, picture to this, especially the smaller manufacturers, which I am one, my company is uh, 140, three years old this year, um, fourth generation and um, located in Bridgeport. And it's very challenging for small companies like mine to be able to stay up on all the different advances in technology that are happening, the need for us all to be um, really diving deep into Industry 4.0, um, which includes everything from robotics to augmented reality and artificial intelligence and uh, automation and all the other things that are going to allow us to be competitive in what we all understand is a high cost, high value state that we're, we're living in. And uh, I think this bill and the team that's going to be put together to work on um, kind of capturing what is in, in existence and putting it together in a way that would be very accessible to, to all manufacturers in the state, but especially small manufacturers would be very, very valuable. And I, and I also really like the makeup of the team and the, um, the suggested chairs uh, as far as CCAT and CONSTEP who both offer tremendous value to manufacturers in the areas of Industry 4.0. And you know, for people who are not involved in um, manufacturing, there is it, from the outside for us looking in, uh, there isn't actually even really 100% agreement on what Industry 4.0 is. We've got a lot of work to um, to get together and and hash that out and be able to make it transparent to the customer, which is us. So I, I think this bill is an excellent um, next step in that uh, in, in the journey that we started. Uh, a couple of years ago. So um, that's it. And if anybody's got any questions, um, I'll go with the mayors. I'm the generalist and Eric Brown is the detail guy. <laughs> I think he's coming up to testify, but if there's anything I can offer. Well, Kathy, first of all, I want to thank you for being with us today. And I also want to thank you for the um, uh, inordinate amount of time that you devote. I mean, you are a small manufacturer, but you have been so uh, steeped in um, promoting the manufacturing sector um, in so many ways and for as long as I could remember. Um, and your voice has been uh, very important um, and I think has also certainly helped me um, to understand you know, the landscape a, a lot better. And to your point, um, Kathy, uh, you know, there's been a lot accomplished in, you know, a relatively recent short amount of time. We now for the first time have our chief manufacturing officer. I'm glad we got away from that thing, that czar title that was being floated <laughs> down there a little bit that, that kind of made me nervous, but, but, um, and, and interestingly enough, the uh, Senator Murphy talks to me about this all the time. They are trying to model what Connecticut has done on a national level. Um, and so, it, you know, it, but it has served us well because, and of course, fortuitously, who could have imagined, and the chief manufacturing officer himself, of what, what headwinds we were walking into when all of a sudden the lights went out and, you know, COVID was upon us and manufacturing was 
crucial. The, and the pivoting that that industry did during this time to meet our demands has helped to uh, put Connecticut where we are nationally um, you know, in terms of all of the other states in the country uh, on, on our COVID response. And, that, and, and manufacturers played a very um, important role in that. So uh, to your point, um, that, uh, you know, has helped us to define the sector, to advocate with one voice. And this now um, uh, working group, I think, is a continuation of that progress. Um, and to your point, industry 4.0, no, people, I mean, I certainly don't know exactly what this is. I think it could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but we do understand the automation of the sector. And we also recognize, um, you know, the comp our composition of this, the sector. We have the real big guys, the aerospace, the defense manufacturers, and then we've got, you know, the, the middle level companies, and then we've got the small manufacturers. And there is all a very important role um, for them as we try to make Connecticut a manufacturing destination. And I think, you know, you're right. So we do have high energy costs. We do have you know, high cost of living, those obviously always weigh on us, but we have been able to move beyond those um, challenges with our workforce, um, with our, you know, our ingenuity, with our collaborations. And this working group is, you know, in my view, uh, the mechanism to once again, bring us to the forefront of the, you know, the 21st century um, manufacturing uh, technology. So um, I'm very interested in the concept that was brought before us um, by CMC um, and, uh, you know, uh, Eric and yourself and all of the other leaders in this. Um, so uh, thanks for being with us. I don't have any questions. That was a very long commentary on my point, but only to say, um, this, I think, really will be another tool that's going to uh, distinguish us amongst our competitors. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if we have um, other folks with hands raised here. I do not see any. Um, and if there are no other um, people, I just want to say thanks, Kathy, for being available to us today and always. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Be, be well. Um, and so, Madam Clerk, correct me if I'm getting out of order, but it looks to me like Olivia Rinks is next um, on our sign up uh, list. Olivia, that... Olivia is not present. So, next we have Lynn Ward. Okay, That's great, because I know she's got some time restraints. Um, yes, Lynn. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Senators Hartley and Martin, Representatives Simmons and Buckby and members of the Commerce Committee. I'm Lynn Ward, President and CEO of the Waterbury Regional Chamber. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of the Naugatuck Valley Regional Development Corporation. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony on this legislation. The Waterbury Regional Chamber, which serves 14 communities in Greater Waterbury and represents the interests of nearly 1,000 members on matters of public policy, strongly supports the proposed Senate Bill 1020, an act establishing a regional economic development pilot program in the Naugatuck Valley. We are advocating for this newly developed concept because a regional approach to economic development combined with public-private investment can lead to more successful outcomes than a splintered approach with each municipality working independently. Due to an increasingly global, competitive global economy, the efforts of smaller towns to engage effectively in attracting, retaining, and expanding business now demands a level of resources and marketing that is often not achievable by independent municipal governments. An integrated approach with investment from the state of Connecticut, such as the proposed pilot program, can take economic development in the Naugatuck Valley to the next level. The business community is enthusiastic about the future of our region and stands ready to support regional efforts. For these reasons, the chamber asks the committee to approve the proposed Senate Bill 1020. Thank you for the opportunity today. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, for being with us and also for um, 
your uh, unrelenting, tireless work uh, in promoting um, Waterbury, the Naugatuck Valley, um, and uh, all of your membership. Again, tell me, how many towns does the regional chamber represent? We represent 14 towns in the greater Waterbury region. And, and that's like a population of what? Oh, I believe it's close to 300,000. I don't know exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, that, so that, sounds, that sounds right. And so, you know, st small state that we are, um, clearly, you know, any one of those 14 towns on their own and even your core city, um, and, and I'm not sure if Naugatuck is next in terms of, you know, population amongst your, um, you know, your membership, but, you know, are less able, and some of them are not able at all to um, engage and to, to, to play in some of these arenas. And I remember not too long ago, we had this discussion about the Brownfields Land Banks, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, from a, a, an urban renewal um, and, and restoration perspective, there were many smaller towns um, that just could not um, participate, um, but yet, New England and the Northeast, be, with all of the manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, history and all of the, the vestiges of, you know, old manufacturing, uh, have the need, at, but yet, you know, were in a position where they, they, they could not participate. So it's this kind of a discussion, I think, that is so timely here um, and that has been pointed out. So I, I want to thank you as the, you know, the head of the, the regional chamber for um, you know, supporting this and also you know, bringing these kind of ideas um, to your membership, um, those companies that are uh, participants so that you know, we can all utilize every resource we have um, and certainly in this timely fashion. So I don't see any hands raised. Let me just check here again. Um, and if not, uh, I will say thanks so much Thank for you. your absence for being with us um, and uh, we look forward to, you know, continuing um, to, to do the good work and support your good work. Thank you, uh, thank Lynn. Thank you, Senator. And thank you all. Have a great day, everyone. Yes, yes, you too. Um, and so, uh, Madam Clerk, does that bring us to um, sign-up sheet number 10? And that is Tommy Hyde uh, representing the Naugatuck Valley Development Corp. Yes. Yeah, and so, uh, Mr. Hyde. Thank you, uh, Senator Harley and, and Martin and uh, Representative Simmons and, and Buckby and, and the rest of the Commerce Committee. I appreciate the time today to come before you and, and speak in, in support of Senate Bill 1020. Um, rather than reading my testimony, and I know um, Mayor Hess um, touched on a lot of this previously, I, I figured I'd jump right into it and talk a little bit more about the organization and then maybe answer some of the questions that Senator Martin had. Um, asked uh, Mayor Hess. So as indicated before, it's really a partnership between Naugatuck and Waterbury to help spur economic development in those two municipalities with, with the goal of expanding. And I think Senator Hartley, you had mentioned earlier, why, why is there a need for this legislation? And I think what we're asking for is, is a partnership between you know, an organization, those municipalities in the state, and that partnership would come in the form of matching funding. So right now, there's um, three loan programs that we currently have. In those loan programs, we have about $3 million um, in the bank and about $2 million outstanding. You know, we, we continue to make loans, although not as much anymore, but based on, you know, the timing of this legislation and, and what happens between now and then, you know, the, the ultimate match will be decided kind of at that time. So we expect it to be somewhere between 2.5 and three, I would guess. Um, and then, you know, the, the ask would be for from a match for the state at that time. The other thing I know um, Senator Mar Martin touched on was, you know, how does how does um, another municipality join in, in the organization and, and what's that ultimate cost to, to the municipality? We're actually discussing this um, later this week at our board meeting. But I think the, the way I would think about it is, you know, we we would put up NVRDC would put up these funds. They would be matched from the state. And then based on you know, what the overall services that municipality wants from the organization, 
there would be an agreement or a contract for the organization to provide those services. And that would come with some sort of fee. You know, the, the goal is to keep that fee as low as possible, but it would depend on kind of what the goals of that municipality does have for the organization. And then I think once you're on, then you would be, you would be able to access that additional matching funding from the organization in, in the state for development projects in your municipality if and, and when it's needed. So I think those were the, the, the main questions I wrote down. I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions at this time. Uh, so thank you very much, um, Tommy. Uh, and uh, also I thank you for um, you know, your creativity and recognizing that um, there are partnerships to be had um, and, and being good stewards of um, you know, municipal resources that we need to kind of look in different ways to do that. So to your knowledge, does this model exist um, any other place in the state or any other place that you know of? Not that I'm aware of, Senator. You know, I was present at the Commerce Committee meeting a few years ago when we, um, the Fairfield County Five brought forth something similar. Um, you know, I don't think at that point there was a, a match along with that. It was really additional funding to go into New York City and try to bring companies out of out of New York into the into the you know greater Fairfield area. Uh, I don't believe that bill ultimately passed, but other than this, um, no. Something similar potentially was, again, a, a couple of years ago, the, the state passed the MRDA legislation, which was, you know, essentially trying to take the CRDA and make it statewide. And I don't believe there's been any movement on that either. Um, so, so, so no, this would be a first of its kind. You know, the goal would be to build out a pilot program, come up with a model that hopefully can be implemented in other municipalities around the state. So, okay, that, that's your... That's the point that I was driving at. So um, you're looking to obviously um, kind of uh, develop this um, and then offer it as a model that where it could be scaled um, on a statewide basis, meaning that um, you know other regional economic development agencies uh, could, if they meet certain criteria, uh, also seek to access state uh, collaboration resources in conjunction with their, um, their, their economic projects. Correct. Yeah, um, so um, I'm just trying to understand a little bit more of getting in the weeds, how this works. So right now, um, you know, Mayor has talked about skin in the game and that's really important. So this is not a request for an outright grant of state dollars, an earmark or anything like that. This is, we have um, a certain amount of dollars that we are looking to leverage with state dollars. And right now you're talking about um, in the existence of the members that you have, potentially, potentially 5 million. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. And so in this arrangement, you, um, do you, does this model need to have a certain number of um, uh, towns, towns signing on um, in order for you to qualify um, to seek a, a state match? Yeah, so right now, again, it's, it's Waterbury and Naugatuck. The way the legislation is written, we would have to add at least an additional three towns in order to um, access that funding. I see. Okay. Um, so the legislation is effective upon passage, is it? I, I, I have to check that. Do you know, Tommy? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. But uh, nonetheless. July, July 1st. Yeah, so, okay, it's a July one. So then um, despite the fact that it, you know, let's be optimistic, it passes and so forth, it's, you're, an application to the state is not possible until the development authority reaches that minimum threshold of the number of regions as, as part of it. That's correct. 
I see. And then at that point, um, what what is is there any dollar threshold by which the uh, development authority has to have and maintain in order to leverage state dollars? So the the only dollar threshold that I'm aware of is it would be a match. So whatever we can you know put forward, the state would ultimately have to match that up to five million dollars. Up to so so there's a cap. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, up to $5 million um, in what interval per project annually? Um, I believe it's through the, the entirety of the program, which sunsets in 2026. So the, the, the entire amount to be able to access ultimately would be $5 million. Okay. And tell me why the sunset. Um, you know, I think that, that it's a good opportunity to take a step back and look and see if the organization was ultimately successful. You know, if it's if it's not successful, it's obviously something we don't want to continue and continue funding. So it's a you know, it's a, um, a safeguard, if you will, to ensure that this that the, the funding is being used in appropriate ways. And if not, then it should be remitted back to the state. And so um, let's say you've got your match on the table, you've secured the state match. So then what happens? Is it um, per project or are the projects then decided by vote of the board? What, what are the mechanics? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, w once we got to that five municipality threshold, there would hopefully be, you know, different development opportunities that would come forward. And, you know, that those development opportunities would be evaluated by myself and, and the larger board. Um, and in the event, one of those makes sense and, and they need that, you know, gap financing in order to get that development done, they would be a, awarded a, a sum of money in, in, in the amount that helps them do that. What's the composition of the board? So right now um, it's um, 11, uh, 11 members. It, they include folks like David Rotateri, treasurer, or David Rotateri, the CEO of Ion Bank, Kathy A. Watt of the Northwest Regional Workforce Investment Board, Jonathan Albert, um, president of Cornerstone Realty, Realty both mayors, um, Lynn Ward, who just previously spoke of the chamber, and, and, and several other business leaders in the, in the greater Naugatuck Valley area. Okay, so anyway, it's the existing board. You're not putting together a new board. I guess that was my question. So the, the I believe early last year, so originally maybe taking a step back. So there was an entity called the Noctuck Valley Development Corporation. And in 2000, 2004, that organization kind of stopped performing a lot of the functions it was doing at the time. And, and the Waterbury Development Corporation was created. Um, the Nogdok Valley Development Corporation remained in existence with a small board and, and has done some very minor things over the last several years, including, you know, they own the Time Expo building in Waterbury, which um, historically was le leased out for the Time Expo Museum. Um, and then prior to my arrival in, in building this organization, when, when both mayors got together, they created a new board, renamed it Nogdok Valley Development Corporation or Regional Development Corporation and uh, the organization inherited the assets of the NVDC. So the, the, the board is relatively new. Um, you know, whether or not that board will be expanded based on you know, uh, additional municipalities coming on board is, is something that, that hasn't been you know, figured out yet. Um, um, I've, I've spoken with first selectmen, chiefs of staff of economic development directors up and down the Naugatuck Valley. And I plan to you know, hold several round tables with them going forward to understand what their needs are, how the organization could be beneficial. Ultimately, as part of this, will it be required for them to have a seat at the table? And it, is that something they want? Um, so some of those would, would still have to be figured out, but for, for now, the board is staying the way it is. Okay, that's my question. Okay, you know, how, how you see the, the rep representation. Um, yeah, and I, Senator, I think, you know, really it's gonna depend on the municipalities, right? So some may want to seat at the table, others may not. So the, the idea here is to be responsive to those municipalities and figure out exactly what their needs are. And then, you know, not only is this funding going to be, you know, I, I shouldn't say that the funding isn't the be all end all of the NVRDC. You know, we, we hope to provide a, a variety of services to 
municipalities outside this, you know, potential funding. This is just one tool in the toolbox that ultimately we, we hope to be able to utilize. Okay, thanks very much, Tommy. Um, uh, Senator Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Tom, how are you? Afternoon, Senator, doing well, how are you? Pretty good, thanks. Th and thanks for coming to testify. Uh, I had some additional questions for, uh, for Mayor Hess, and, uh, but I held them and I might as well ask, ask you. Uh, Absolutely. So, you know, we have COGS, you know, the councils of government, and yep. uh, we have the water barrier, the Naugatuck one. Uh, and I know Bristol's part of that, and I believe Plymouth and uh, most of my communities are part, part of that. I guess uh, a little, I almost see this as a competing entity regarding those, the, the COG from Waterbury. Can you explain how this is gonna be different? Yeah, absolutely. And I know Rick Dunn, the, the head of the COG fairly well. I've talked to him at length about this to ensure we're, we're not competing. You know, the, the COG is really planning in transportation and, and they don't really have an economic development arm from my understanding. So this would be almost uh, um, uh, in addition to the COG, an additional service that municipalities would be able to access. As my understanding that the COGs were, you know, they did do receive funding uh, state grants and federal grants and that, you know, whatever project that they may have going on, whatever planning that they go on, that was part of their function, their responsibility. So uh, I'm not an expert, but I believe, a, a, I believe a lot of the funding that they oversee is load SIP, which is transportation oriented, as well as, you know, they do have some federal brownfield remediation programs. But again, I think you know, when, when we're thinking about this, we want to be, uh, uh, you know, we want to be working alongside the COG. So if a developer comes in and, and is looking to take a brownfield and, and redevelop it, you know, be able to pull funding from various sources across the state, whether that's COG brownfield funding, state brownfield funding. Um, and then, you know, our, our funding would be just on top of that. So the idea, and I'm sure you're familiar with brownfield, if you're not, they are extremely expensive to redevelop and you know we have several in Waterbury now that have gone through various iterations of state funding and you know even though every year or every other year they get additional funding there's just more that's needed in order to clean them up so you know the idea would be to pull funding from various sources including our own to help get over the hurdle and, and get these developments um, going forward. So you're talking about the, a developer being sort of having a gap in, in order to go forward with their project and you're looking to maybe take care of that stack or part of that stack or uh, be part of that stack, I guess. Yeah, in my opinion, Senator, those are the only deals we should be taking up at this point. You know, we, we, don't, we don't wanna be going out and incentivizing companies who can come in and, and do the work. We wanna make sure we have an understanding of what the financial realities are of that development. And if there is a need for that gap financing, we would step in and provide it. If not, then you know those are deals that we should be letting the market take care of itself. So, Tom, uh, are those going to be pretty much loans rather than grants? Yes, I think you know a, a low interest loans would be my preference. Yeah, I I, I think that's important to be part. Uh, over it being grant-based rather than uh, loan-based because I like the fact that you guys got, you said $3 million in the bank and you have currently 2 million out in, out in loans. Is that correct? correct. Right. right. Yeah, I kind of like that model rather than a grant-based because your funding disappears pretty quickly. And I'd <laughs> like to think that if we do move forward with this, that uh, the funds that we give you are going to multiply for your future use rather than you keep coming back to the state for more money. Right. That That is absolutely the goal, Senator. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want to be coming back every year for additional funding. So, you know, the idea is, is get a revolving account going and be able to lend, lend, the, lend those monies out multiple times over the next several years. Obviously, you know, it, it, pending projects and, and want, we, we may run out of money sooner rather than later. But again, as that, as that money revolves back in, then we'll have the opportunity to, to you know, reutilize it. Um, just one last question regarding the, uh, the metrics 
and you know so so that if this is a successful pilot program how do you plan on measuring your success so that we uh you know this committee decides and sees that wow look what's happening with the Naugatuck uh board here or this uh, group uh, how do you plan on on proving to us that gee this is a worthwhile program and it should be extended out to other communities or groups in throughout the state because i know bristol had something similar years ago and they got some uh, some monies from the state and i and i just vaguely remember the conversation because i was brought in there was a couple of bankers uh, along with the bristol chamber of commerce or central connecticut chamber of commerce i should say and they were looking for something similar to what you guys are asking for here. And, and it basically it was like, all right, this ain't happening. Uh, so how, how can you, how can we make sure that the metrics are, are what we are, go we, what we are going to need in order to sell this down the road? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's a few ways to measure it. And, you know, I'm happy to work with you further on, you know, if, if you have ideas on, on what you think those best metrics are, you but- Want to ball yeah. back to me? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, net, net new tax revenue to this to this municipality that wouldn't be happening but for these investments is going to be a key one. You know, we can look at things like if, if it is a TOD investment with maybe some mixed use retail amount of new um, residential uh, apartments, you know, whether or not this ultimately spurs other developments. So you, you look at a place like Naugatuck and right near their train line, they have a parcel B that they're looking to potentially bringing development, does our development ultimately spur other developments in the area? Um, so I think there's, there's a few ways to, to look at it. You know, I'd be happy to, to think about that a little bit more. I think, you know, the, the legislation calls for these metrics to be created. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm happy to work with, with you and, and the larger committee on, on what those ultimately are. Uh, I, I hear, heard that you uh, have a board meeting coming up very shortly, but I think that should be part of the discussion. But thank you, Tom. I appreciate your answers to my questions. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the, and the board will hold me accountable for this. I can assure you of that. And I'm sure th th they would like to weigh in on this as well. Thank you, Senator Martin. Uh, Representative Leepor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you, Tommy, for, for all of these really detailed um, answers. I, I am curious about what you perceive as the merits of this region by region approach, rather than what it seems sort of like what we heard earlier from DCD, which is providing from an overall state perspective um, to all regions in the state for focused economic development and how this sort of fits in with that approach. It's a great question. So I think, you know, and the DECD incentive is really what, when the business comes in and creates jobs. From, from my perspective, this would be a, a, almost a precursor to that. So we know up and down the, the Naugatuck Valley, Route 8 corridor, there's brownfields, there's historic buildings. And, you know, in order to get a, um, a developer into those, we, I feel that there, if we can provide some incentive up front, Ultimately, those jobs and other opportunities will come in afterwards. You know, again, it's it's similar to what we see going on in Hartford with the CRDA and them providing incentives to um, redevelopment in the city. Um, and again, there there was legislation to take that model kind of statewide, and it, it stalled. It was passed, but it was never implemented. And it, it would have allowed basically, you know, smaller municipalities to team up and access funding similar to the CRDA type model, or it would have allowed a large municipality such as Waterbury to go and access those fundings on its own. Again, that, that never really took off and hasn't. So the idea behind this is since, you know, this isn't getting rolled out on a statewide basis, can we do it on a regional basis and, and focused? And now the other thing is, uh, and I'm not positive, but I, I not sure how many regional economic development initiatives there are throughout the state. And, you know, part of Mayor O'Leary and Mayor Hess's idea to, to create this and, and expand it further um, is based off the, that ultimate model that would help benefit um, municipalities in the, in the region. And just as, and I'm, I am eager to do whatever we can uh, in this legislature to 
spur economic development and certainly in in regions that are in greater need of economic development than others as i think that helps us all but you mentioned fairfield county five earlier i i happen to be a state rep representing fairfield and in talking with our economic director who is wonderful he had expressed that that was a great initiative but that the limiting factor of it was that it really needed to have the force of the full state and it needed to have the funding of the full state to be effective. And so I was wondering if you had sort of any thoughts or responses to, to that perspective. And sorry, when you're, are you talking about the Fairfield County five initiative? Yeah. Which was to be a regional approach to bring right. economic development to, to Fairfield County, but particularly there were five communities that had, had regionalized to do this work. And, right, so and they had said that they thought one of the barriers of the approach was that being just the five communities wasn't sufficient. So, so they wanted a statewide approach to focus just on Fairfield County. No, to, that it needed to be a state level work and that doing it regionally, what didn't kind of have enough power behind it to bring in the type of economic development that the state really needed. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't familiar with that, you know, and, and again, what, what this organization ultimately becomes, you know, I, I, the, um, the funding and trying to get over that development cost, that, that's just a piece of it. You know, the, the municipalities in the Naugatuck Valley, several of them don't have, you know, enough funding in their budget for economic development directors. For instance, there was an article the other day that, or maybe a month ago now, Seymour was looking to hire an uh, economic development director full time, but they only had about $35,000 in the budget to do so. So the idea here is pooling resources on these municipalities that can't afford, you know, full time ec economic development expertise and hiring, you know, one or two additional economic development professionals to work across multiple municipalities. So, again, uh, you know, the, the, the money is there as, as a piece of it, but I, I think there are greater needs that our organization are going to ultimately serve these, these communities that have really struggled um, historically. I hope, does that answer your question? Or? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot in that way, but that no, type sir. of regionalizing that you just described, like municipalities are free to do that any day, correct? So they don't need state in, in money to do that work. Uh, absolutely, and, and you've seen that you know, up to this point with, with Naugatuck and Waterbury. And the goal is to expand to those other municipalities. And again, we, we have funding in the bank. What, what we're asking for is, is a match of that funding. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate your responses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th yes, thank you, Rep. Leeper. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's a very um, instructive uh, exchange there. But if I'm understanding this correctly, this um, distinguishes itself from maybe other proposals that came before us um, in that there is uh, a regional match. Um, and I did and was intrigued by the way, Rep Lepore, uh, by the um, discussion about the Fairfield Five, but that was a request for an out and out state grant, so to speak. Um, I think there are some metrics in this particular proposal, which are a little bit different which say there's a minimum, um, you know, number of people or, or um, towns that must participate, um, and then there is, a, you know, a dollar amount that much must be matched, so to speak, in order to be eligible to uh, leverage state funds. So, um, in that respect, I do believe um, it's it's you know an iteration. Um, and I think perhaps, um, you know, a positive change on doing this, uh, you know, this particular kind of discussion. And then with respect to doing it on a statewide basis, you know, Advanced CT is, is supposed to now be our new entity that has been explicitly stood up for the purposes of economic development. Um, so as to make sure that, you know, we are very skilled in doing this as opposed to previously when it was under the umbrella of um, DECD. 
so, so I think there are, you know, s- some positive developments as, you know, we continue to perfect um, our tools um, in, in economic development. Um, Sen- Senator, if, if I may, just to build off that point. So Advanced CT, I, I work with them almost on a daily basis. And, you know, what, what they've been doing is obviously going into New York City and, and other, you know, states and, and countries to try to attract development into the area. What, what, what happens is they go out and they find a business who may be interested in Connecticut. And, you know, there's a very specific criteria of what that build, what that business is looking for. Maybe it's a 100,000 square foot building, access to local highways or trains or, or, or whichever that is. And, you know, they essentially are in the process of building a database. But what I've found with municipalities I've talked to in the Valley is those without that kind of professional economic development um, team or person, you know, those responsibilities of responding to an advanced CT about those available properties in your district fall on a chief of staff or someone, you know, maybe it's the elected official themselves. So there, I've seen there's, there's a lot of missed opportunity where, you know, because of whatever's on your plate, you don't have appropriate staffing, that you don't have the capacity to respond to advanced CT, or maybe you don't even have the capacity to go out and take a, you know, a, a sample of the sites that you would really like to see developed and put them on their site finder website. And again, I think that's a, an additional service that ultimately when we're talking with other municipalities about joining is that they're gonna find very attractive. So, you know, Waterbury just went, up, went through an initiative where they, they created a new marketing and branding campaign. And part of that includes all the available properties within Waterbury. So when Advanced CT reaches out and they're looking for something specific, I can actually go on Waterbury's website, look at what's available and then send it right off to them. Um, m- m- no other municipalities that I've talked to have something similar to that. And I think ultimately that's the, that's the kind of organization we wanna grow to. So when Advanced CT does get that, you know, that, that lead, they can come directly to me. I have an understanding of what the available properties are and, and what the specs of the, those properties are. And we can respond to them extremely quickly and efficient to try to compete for these these companies who are looking to move into Connecticut. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Um, are there, um, let's see, further hands. Yes, uh, Representative Rochelle. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Hyde, Tommy, if you can please share with us, I represent Yansonia and Derby, which are in the Valley, first and fifth most economically distressed in the state of Connecticut. Can you share the types of resources and services that would be available if my towns chose to opt into this pro- uh, into working with your team? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've touched on a lot of them, you know, Rep. Rochelle, but, you know, one first and foremost is really you know, uh, uh, economic development professional that, you know, there's an agreement with that that person understands what the needs and the goals are of that municipality and is working every day to get those done. You know, two would, uh, you know, potentially be this, you know, if if we don't get the match that it'll be a smaller pool of funding, but potentially a pool of funding to help, um, you know, municipalities incentivize and or get over those hurdle costs or gap financing, if you will in order to get development projects done. Third is kind of this, you know, concierge service with advanced CT to really understand, you know, what what the goals of the city are, what properties would they like to see redeveloped and ensure we're promoting them to both advanced CT and and other businesses, both within and without the state. And fourth, and, and, and this may be a little ways down the road, but the other thing I've heard from, you know, municipal leaders is, Oftentimes there'll be, maybe it's a grant from the state, maybe it's a grant from the feds or, or some sort of project. And again, you know, that, that chief of staff or, or, or someone else, maybe with not a lot of project management experience is um, overseeing that project. Um, and, you know, obviously if you're new and you're taking over a multi-million dollar project, it, it can be extremely difficult. And then conversely, you know, what I've seen um, having grown up in Derby you know, um, especially around Route 34, is sometimes when there's a, a change in leadership, those plans change. It's difficult to get, you know, continuity because maybe there's a new elected official or new staff. So, you know, ultimately, long term, it would be some sort of outsourcing of project management for large scale projects. 
that you know municipalities would be able to utilize expertise in, in order to get those projects done. So that that's the perfect scenario if everything goes 100% that that all happens. The, the, that's what we're thinking of now and we're, we're trying to accomplish, but obviously th there's still a lot of work to do with that. All right, thank you so much. I'm a, obviously a huge fan of this initiative. Thank you, uh, Rep Rochelle. Uh, Representative Buckby. Hello, oh, Madam Chair. Yes, and good afternoon. Welcome good to you. Good afternoon, it's been one of those days. Uh, Tommy, thank you for your testimony. Uh, and thank you for our conversations we've had. Uh, as far as this, this goes, I have a couple of, obviously, you know, uh, in our discussions, I have some concerns uh, with regionalizing uh, what we do. And you know, the continuity you just mentioned, that's something that really affects all of us. We all have that change when that happens from, uh, you know, leadership in any community when it goes from one to another. So, I, you know, I guess my, my biggest question is, you, you mentioned the collective economic development, which I think is a great idea. If one town can't afford it, you, you put them together and you, you do two, three townships and, and you build that way. Um, is that something that's, that you guys have already established or are you waiting for this to see if you can, if you're gonna spend that money and put that person in there? No, so I think, you know, right now it's established in the extent that I'm working across both Waterbury and Naugatuck. I think given you know, the workload of those municipalities, ultimately, if and when we bring new municipalities on board, our staff would have to um, grow as well. So, but we also know when those municipalities come on board, there's going to be some sort of fee or you know, funding structure that they're gonna have to put their skin in the game in order to access the services. So we're, we're, we're lucky to be in a, in a fairly decent financial position. And if we had to hire that person prior to you know, expanding into other municipalities, we, we would have the ability to do so. Um, and I don't want to say we're waiting for this legislation. You know, again, the, the board is relatively new. I'm new to the organization. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and trying to talk with municipal leaders about what their needs are. And I plan to do that a lot more in, in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but once we have that understanding of what exactly they expect out of our organization, we'll be in a much better position to grow and, and hire additional employees in order to fulfill those exact needs. I appreciate that. And I think the, the concern I have with it is it, it's a lot of money and we're, we're really laser focusing this on one community as opposed to the entire state. And, and I, while I understand what you're trying to do, I'd also like, for me personally, I'd like to see the organization that you're building um, to have completed something to have already shown this is what we've done and this is how much bigger it will be right now it sounds like there's so many new people and new pieces and still building that it's it still feels to me more conceptual maybe you can uh, speak to that it just feels right now that it's it hasn't gotten the work done yet because it's like waiting on the on the funding right no I, I again I, I wouldn't say it's waiting on the funding by any means and, and representative I want to assure you you know th this funding we're not looking to cover salaries or office overhead or anything like that the, the funding is really going to be to try to incentivize development in the area you know being a one-man shop to be quite honest with you I want to ensure that both Waterbury and Naugatuck are happy and satisfied with my services before I expand and I think, you know, Senator, or sorry, Mayor Hess alluded to that earlier. And I know Mayor O'Leary would love to have been here. He's given the state of the city in about 10 minutes. So he, he unfortunately couldn't be here. But, you know, I don't think it'd be good practice to, to expand too quickly and, and not, you know, ensure that Waterbury and Naugatuck are happy with the plan the board has bought in. And that's, that's kind of where we are now. But part of that also is, as you can imagine, is, you know, if you're looking at the Valley, Derby is different than Ansonia, which is different than Seymour, which is different than Beacon Falls. And, you know, again, I don't want to open my arms and bring all these new towns in, not saying that those are the ones we'll ultimately be a partner with, but we want to have a very good understanding of what those needs are and services they would like to ultimately see provided before we expand. And I think part of that was me understanding exactly the different services that Waterbury and Naugatuck provide, because I can tell you with, with Naugatuck, you know, in, in, in my agreement and understanding with Mayor Hess, he he's, has me focused on four specific projects. 
you know, everything else, he, he, you know, and that, that's really it. Whereas Waterbury, it's, it's different. There, there's a multitude of things I do for the city. And, you know, again, I know Mayor has talked about the 30, um, 70 split and funding that they provide to the organization. But I also, given that Waterbury is a larger municipality, do play a much larger role in that municipality. So as, as we kind of feel this out and, and move forward and understand what those other needs are based on that municipality, because ultimately, you know, I've had one chief of staff tell me I'm not interested in the money. I don't, you know, I don't think that money would be beneficial if you can get me a project manager to oversee a, 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 a long-term development project, that is what I'm ultimately most interested in. Or if we could have an economic development professional who knows how to go out and attract new businesses, then ultimately that's what I'm going to be looking for out of this organization. So, you know, again, the, the money is a, is a tool in the toolbox in the event that a development project comes aboard and, and it needs that gap financing. But I don't expect all municipalities to expect the same sort of services out of my organization. And I want to ensure I have a clear and full understanding of what those services are they ultimately expect and the ability to provide that before expanding. I appreciate that. And, and by no means do I question your work ethic or the work that you're doing there. Uh, and no, it's great. I just, I just see it as, uh, you know, every township across the state is doing the same thing without the additional funding and trying to fight to bring new business in. And, and I think uh, my concern with this is really, you know, supporting regional development on a, on, from, a, from the state to me is, is my concern with it as we, as we've spoken about. So, Yep. Um, I, I'm looking forward to reading more of the testimony. I, I missed some of this morning's uh, uh, testimony because I was uh, bouncing between <laughs> committee meetings, but uh, uh, I certainly want to read more about it and feel more comfortable with it before we get to the, to the voting process. But you bring a lot to the table and I appreciate the work that you're doing. I just, it, it's tougher. It's a tougher pill for me to swallow when it's, uh, you know, really when you think about the taxpayer dollars from across the state to develop one central part of the state, um, when they're all trying to do the same in their own communities as well. No, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying, Representative. I, I appreciate the feedback and the honesty. You know, I'll push back a little bit in that, you know, we are working regionally. We have two mayors that have pledged to work regionally. Again, I'm not sure if there's many other towns working regionally on econ economic development similar to this. And again, we, we would need to expand in order to get that. And you know, we understand the importance of the state dollar and the taxpayer dollar. And, and that's why, you know, I think the match is really crucial here is we're not asking the state to put in anything above and beyond that, you know, we're willing to put in ourselves. But I, I understand your point of view. I, I appreciate your feedback and your conversations. And I'm, I'm happy to continue those at any time with you. I hope that we have more from Tommy. Thank you. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Senator, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yes, I know my phone was, was ringing at the same time. Um, uh, I don't see any other hands raised um, unless I'm missing something, Madam uh, Clerk. And so if not, then um, thank you very much, Tommy, for being with us um, today. Uh, and this is certainly uh, a TBC. Um, thank you. And thank so- you. I think we um, are on our next um, speaker. That's Eric Brown, who is the Vice President of the Manufacturing Policy for CBIA and CMC. Uh, good afternoon, Eric. Good afternoon, Senator Hartley, uh, Representative Simmons, Representative Buckby, and Senator Martin as leaders of the committee. It's a great pleasure to be before you and distinguished colleagues on the committee today. It's been a while. It's great to see you again. Uh, yes, I'm, I thank you for that introduction. I am here on behalf of both CBIA and the CMC. For those of you who may uh, not be as familiar with those organizations, CBIA represents uh, nearly about a thousand manufacturers uh, statewide, the vast majority of which are, are very small and mid-sized manufacturers. And the CMC is a, a collection of the major manufacturing associations in the state. Uh, those associations are listed along with its mission at the bottom of page one of my testimony, if you're interested in that. So thank you for raising Bill 1021, um, an act uh, establishing a manufacturing technology working group 
Uh, I know sometimes bills that have the name working group or task force in them are sometimes uh, looked at as being maybe less than priority bills, but I wanna assure you that to the manufacturing community, this is a very critical bill. Uh, the CMC came together uh, back uh, in 2018, about two and a half years ago. And uh, the very first thing they embarked upon was building a roadmap. Uh, there was gonna be a new governor, we knew that, and a new legislature. And we thought uh, we needed to uh, give them some uh, advice uh, on, on how to help manufacturing. And there were really three pillars as part of that uh, roadmap. Um, the first was uh, we needed to try and address the fragmentation within uh, state government itself amongst different agencies. And uh, that led, thanks to the leadership of, uh, of this committee, uh, to the creation of the chief manufacturing officer position. And Colin Cooper has done a great job with that. So that was sort of step one. Step two was workforce. And uh, the governor has put together the, his workforce council, as well as an office of workforce strategy. I know this committee and the legislature, other committees are working with those groups to implement what is, uh, they put together a terrific strategic plan, uh, which again is in part to create a vertically integrated uh, non-siloed system for technology education in Connecticut. So that's going along very well uh, as well. So the third uh, leg of the stool, if you will, is technology. And similarly, um, as been noted by Kathy, uh, we have a lot of terrific uh, private, nonprofit, government, uh, and other types of entities and institutions who are investing heavily in uh, technology capabilities um, largely designed to help the manufacturing community. Uh, but again, we have a situation where uh, these entities um, are not set up to really work collaboratively uh, or cooperatively, not that they don't or choose not to, it's just the way the system works. They're, most of them are grant funded. And so these opportunities come up, they go after them and uh, it's just sort of catch as catch can. And the manufacturing community as, as, as Kathy alluded to uh, is left confused and disheartened, if you will. And that, uh, that leads to a disincentive to expeditious uh, investment in technology upgrade, which is very, very important in the manufacturing uh, uh, universe as, it, as it's evolving. Um, so what this, uh, what this bill would do is create this working group. And uh, what they would actually do is they would, they would look at all these different uh, service providers, if you will, technology service providers, uh, gather their comprehensive profiles, uh, run analysis such as value stream mapping to identify uh, inefficiencies, overlaps, gaps, um, barriers to collaboration uh, and so forth. And with the goal of producing uh, for this committee uh, uh, a report by October 1, 2022, that would represent a strategic plan that uh, would uh, uh, give direction to the creation of this uh, ecosystem that'll be understandable, accessible, logical, uh, efficient um, and for the manufacturing communities, specifically, as, as Kathy said, the small and mid-sized. The only other substantive comment I wanna make from my testimony is just there's one language clarification that I've included uh, towards the end of my testimony about uh, the membership of the uh, advisory council, just making it clear that the chief manufacturing officer would be a member um, and uh, and then in addition to that, representatives of, of other service technology service providers. So uh, again, thank you so much. I appreciate you bringing this bill forward and uh, uh, we look forward to working with you and the rest of the General Assembly to uh, uh, move this bill forward. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try and address them. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thanks for being with us and uh, today, but also, you know, for your um, incredible leadership and work um, on this whole sector um, and on really helping to kind of uh, wade through those silos um, and, and bring everybody on in a collaborative way, um, if, you know, for the, the general um, uh, gains of the whole sector. And I think a lot has been accomplished. So this conversation about technology um, is in particularly 
um, salient at the point which we are right now. And we recognize that Industry 4.0 is the um, industrial revolution uh, in the era that we live in now. Um, and uh, for us to be able to support and provide te uh, technical assistance, um, you know, information to everybody in this sector. You know, we've got what the the, the big guys are, and, and help me out on this, they only represent like 20% of the sector. Um, I, I'm not sure, Eric, but, and then all the rest are the medium, but primarily they are the small manufacturers. What's the breakdown of the composition of the manufacturing community? Well, if you do it by, uh, if you do it by number of employees, uh, I believe the, uh, and, and if you take out, you know, the biggest of the big, the electric boats and the Pratt and Whitney's, um, Sikorsky's and, and, and the like, uh, you, you come to a number that's somewhere, I know Colin Cooper's estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 employees uh, for the average uh, manufacturer. So uh, like so many things in manufacturing, the picture that we have of, of what a manufacturing company looks like uh, um, is, is not necessarily aligned with, with what the reality is. So uh, in addition to trying to uh, uh, teach parents and, and, and students and guidance counselors, sorry, school counselors and others that uh, manufacturing is now clean, high tech uh, and green, uh, no longer dark, dirty and dangerous. Um, it's also the small, it, it, it's also powered by the small shops that are spread some 4,000 of them uh, across the, all parts of Connecticut. So uh, that's, that's hopefully helpful in terms of imagining what the universe of folks we're talking about here is. Yeah, and I recall in, in the Manufacturing Caucus, um, the conversation from is some of these um, manufacturing um, it, CEOs and, and presidents and the like that, you know, they uh, wear a lot of hats. And so it's just in um, possible, quite frankly, for them to be uh, engaged in kind of seeking out um, where the technology um, opportunities might be, uh, be they in terms of taking on grants or, you know, uh, helping to upskill uh, their ultimate operations. Um, and so from that perspective, um, I think there, there is clearly um, work to be done. Eric, can you, and then I, so your comment about, you know, the composition, uh, you know, of this working group is well taken and, you know, uh, also identifying the fact that the, the, the manufacturing, the chief manufacturing officer, um, you know, is uh, going to be central to this involvement. So that's, that is important and, and I absolutely agree. Um, we've also had this conversation about uh, this state being more competitive or um, ensuring uh, that we are um, bringing down, accessing uh, appropriately federal opportunities such as the SBIR, uh, that is the um, Innovation Research Grant and the STTR on the technology side. Can you talk about how that fits in with this? Yeah, um, it, it's maybe not as explicit as it could be in the language, but um, uh, the bill definitely is intended to um, uh, look at or include consideration of, of challenges for startup uh, operations. Um, and um, so obviously they have technology needs as well. And um, so, yeah, yeah absolutely. The, 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 those, the issues that you run into with SBIR and, and STDR with, with new businesses, with startups, um, I mean, that's what we want, right? We want innovation. Uh, we want new ideas. We want new companies coming in. So uh, that's, that's a critical part of this, of this new technology ecosystem that we're, we're, uh, we hope to see come out of this um, effort. Um, and so, Eric, are there any other um, models uh, regarding, you know, putting together this kind of an initiative that exists um, that we know about in other states? 
Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, it, it kind of is modeled a little bit on the CMC, although this, the CMC is an ongoing uh, community. Uh, this working group would be uh, terminated once it uh, delivers its uh, strategic plan. Uh, but again, the idea is to get all the players at the table together. Uh, I mean, to be candid, um, I think a lot because of the way they're funded. Uh, you know, there's there's obviously some concern about competition and and uh, uh, and, and inefficiencies. And uh, I, I think bringing everybody to the table so that they can see, as the CMC saw, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, uh, they can they can learn that by working together, by clarifying their roles, um, by um, by coordinating their funding efforts, and uh, by um, uh, you know giving specific charges to different different swim lanes, if you will, to each of these organizations, they will find that they come out in the end a better, a better off than they do sort of floating out there as separate entities, just kind of clawing for money and clawing for customers uh, as best they can. Uh, the other thing I think that's, that's central to this is, um, I, was, I don't know if this is a great analogy, but if you're building a new house and you're trying to figure out what to do about your, your internet and TV. Uh, you know, you've got a bunch of different options, a bunch of different technologies, and it can be pretty daunting to figure that out. Uh, so, um, you know, we're gonna need an entity that, um, you know, has the ability to help individual companies uh, plan, understand that one size doesn't fit all. Um, you know, you can't just go to the store and see the shiny robot uh, or the shiny AI equipment and say, geez, I'll, I'll grab that. That'll look good in my shop. Uh, that's not the way to approach this. And uh, I think that's why both CCAT and CONSTEP are called upon to chair this because uh, in CONSTEP in particular, um, they have access to manufacturers, small manufacturers like no one else does. And they have tools to help, uh, to help create holistic plans for these groups. And then if you've got an ecosystem in place, then you can draw upon that and say, well, you know, you have this opportunity, you should go to this entity because that's what they're specializing in. Or you should go to this university because they've got great facilities that'll help you test this technology or, or what have you. So it'll, it'll create something that makes sense uh, that, that, uh, that uh, manufacturers can understand uh, and, uh, and know that they don't have to waste a lot of time you know, trying to absorb, uh, you know, the, the fire hose of, of technology change and technology vendors that are out there um, all over the state. Uh, thanks, Eric, um, for those answers. Uh, uh, Rep. Thomas, I believe you had your hand up. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I'm sorry, my camera's off. I had to change locations and I'm uh, uh, saving bandwidth so I don't cut out. If I do, please just signal me. It's a very okay. nice picture, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Brown, for all of your remarks uh, thus far. I know sort of this fourth industrial revolution has been talked about for many years now, so I'm glad to see Connecticut uh, jumping on that bandwagon. Um, I have two questions, uh, not so much about the bill per se, but maybe about the... Um, the industry as it stands now and where it may stand at the conclusion of this bill. Um, are you able to speak at all about, you know, as you alluded to the manufacturing market, small, medium, large, what part of the market do you think realistically would be able to achieve productivity gains, you know, with a full fledged sort of uh, industry 4.0 ecosystem? Is that like half the market, 80%, 10%? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think they all need full fledged, which is kind of what I was alluding to before. They need, each of them need to be very strategic mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their own business goals uh, and their own, what they, what they create, what they want to create, et cetera, what, they're, what pressures they're getting from their customers. Um, what they want to do in, in, in terms of expanding their customer base. I mean, for, here's a good example. You've got the federal government now, um, and Senator Murphy's in the lead on this, uh, 
uh, on the uh, Make America First um, initiative, uh, which is terrific. Um, uh, but you got to make darn well sure you've got the uh, the capacity to fulfill that. So, you know, because of because manufacturing over the past generation has kind of lagged in terms of, of interest and and uh, of of uh, you know bringing in new employees and training programs and so forth, uh, we're behind on that. So, um, you know, part of the reason the business goes overseas is uh, we may have a company here that. Uh, you know, can produce, uh, you know, 100,000 widgets a week. And uh, somewhere in Singapore, they might be able to do a million a day. So um, that's another level of urgency as we um, happily invest more and, and adjust our policies to, to incentivize more production right here at home. Uh, these, all these issues like workforce and, and technology become all the more critical. So I think, uh, I, I, I mean, my sense is the vast majority of businesses not only could um, benefit from incorporating the latest tech, some aspect of the latest technologies, but most of them will have to, to continue to compete. Um, so I, again, I think that a good way to think of it is, is it's not about sort of filling your factory up with I 4.0 stuff. Um, the, 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 the key is to um, you know, again, in a very holistic step-by-step -step approach, you know, where's my business now? Where do I want to go? What are the opportunities today for uh, incorporating advanced technologies? Do I have some sort of repetitive process that a robot could do or something like that? Um, but also planning ahead the next three years, five years, 10 years, uh, where do I see my business going? And where does that uh, direct me in terms of, uh, uh, incorporating advanced technology into my into my operations, and I, I mean, my own impression is there are very few businesses that that uh, would not uh, would not benefit from that kind of analysis. Oh, I so appreciate those comments and couldn't agree more. Um, definitely, um, I, I I very much like that this isn't an all or nothing that companies um, of all sizes can slot in where it's appropriate. And that may answer my next question. Um, I, it seemed to me just from casual articles I've seen over the years that the biggest challenge for most of the smaller mid-sized -size companies is the cost to implement, right? Um, either by hiring someone on their team that can help with the strategic shaping or you know, actual infrastructure investments. And I'm just curious if you, uh, I'll ask you to take out a crystal ball, but please don't feel put on the spot. <laughs> you can ignore the question. But do you see at the end of this um, working group uh, study that the state would need to fund further investment to help these companies achieve these um, efficiencies or is this something that companies would need to invest in on their own? And if so, can they do it? Right, well, that's a great question actually. And I'd break it into two parts. So part of it is, uh, I think part, the first part is what, what, what do manufacturers need to help them understand what they don't understand, to help them know what they don't know, to help them to put together plans uh, and forecasts and, and, and even budgets for uh, incorporating these technologies over time. Um, uh, and I think there is, uh, I mean, uh, forgive me for tooting my horn a little bit because Constep is an affiliate of ours. Um, but, but as I said, I think they're in a unique position to fulfill that. And they receive some funding from the state, but they, they receive a lot of federal funding and actually in President Biden's budget, the federal funding for the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce, but NIST is the, is the, uh, is the organization at the federal level that does the funding for CONSTEP and every CONSTEP-like organization, each state has one. Uh, they're called an MEP, a Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, so there's going to be, um, uh, you know, there's going to be funding 
to help manufacturers do this. Um, and uh, so I think that's part A. Part B is, okay, now I know I've got my plan and I know I could benefit from having this, you know, uh, quarter million dollar uh, uh, new production line in my facility. Uh, how do I go about doing that? And, and uh, or, or uh, getting, getting that, you know, where do I find that funding? And I, I, I think that, um, there are opportunities out there now through the Manufacturing Innovation Fund, which as Senator Hartley and Representative Simmons well know, and probably the rest of the committee know, uh, is, is, is uh, drained its, its original funding of 75 million and, and the governor's proposing some additional funding to keep that going. But they provide dollars not to, not to buy this equipment for companies, but to incentivize or, or to give them a boost, if you will. So it's all requires matching. There's no sort of grants, um, but but that's one funding source. The other, you know, the other way to go about this is is um, you know like any other part of your business, you plan. So you know maybe you can't go out and buy that right now, but um, but you can sort of build it into your your budget over over several years and and uh, and do that. So um, I think the bigger challenge is the first one. The bigger challenge is to help these companies understand what's out there, what makes sense for their business, and uh, sort of what are the steps to uh, go about, uh, uh, you know, getting it into their into their operations. Thank you so much for that crystal ball, and feel free to toot your own horn. If you won't, who else will? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rep. Uh, Thomas. Um, uh, Co-Chair Simmons. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair, and thank you so much, Eric, for for being with us today, for your, your testimony, and for all your leadership of you know the CMC and everything you've done to support our manufacturing industry, you know, especially during this this past difficult year. And um, I am so excited about you know everything you're trying to do here with Industry 4.0, and you know, really helping to to modernize our our manufacturing kind of ecosystem across Connecticut and to make sure that we have the workforce and, um, you know, digital support and technology in place to, to support this, um, you know, revolution that we're, we're having, um, you know, with, with industry 4.0 and, you know, it was really fascinating to hear from, you know, small manufacturers and big manufacturers, you know, at our meeting last month on, on their needs. And so really appreciate everything you're doing to, you know, really build this this coalition of experts, bring everyone to the table around this so we, so we can best prepare for this. Um, and so, so a couple of questions I have are, um, you know, with respect to, to upskilling our workforce and, you know, making sure that they're, you know, trained on these advanced technologies um, to support 4.0. I think that's so, so critical. And I'm wondering kind of how you're thinking about, you know, with our 160,000 kind of manufacturing jobs that we currently have right now, um, are we thinking about how we can make sure that, you know, we're not going to be losing those employees to, you know, automation and, and kind of this digital revolution we're seeing and, you know, making sure that we can preserve those jobs, but also attract new jobs and, and kind of gain new skilled workers to, to fulfill our, our needs over the, over the next decade in this 4.0 industry? Kind of how are you thinking about that from, from a jobs perspective? Well, I think there's some really exciting thinking and work going on in that in Connecticut, as you know, I mean, uh, part of the workforce challenge is the age. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, some outrageous percentage of manufacturing employees, uh, forgive me for not uh, having the exact number, over 55 years old. Um, so, um, so there's going to be a lot of people leaving the workforce. Uh, but to your point, there's great opportunities to reskill and upskill existing employees. And uh, I know the manufacturing caucus is. Uh, Working on putting together a, a forum uh, soon to to uh, to to talk about what's going on in the in the technical education world on manufacturing and uh, Dr. Valerie's is just doing an outstanding job with that. So um, to sort of keep it brief, I, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about that uh, in Connecticut. Um, uh, you know, even our organization is involved in a grant that is currently uh, surveying outstanding, well, we're surveying uh, over 100 uh, K through 12 school systems in Connecticut um, uh, and asking them detailed questions about their technical education programs and measuring the success. 
and we're going to uh, identify the 10 best and uh, do uh, working with a third party to really drill down what makes them as successful and as, as important, how the heck did they make it happen? Because it's one thing to say, for example, um, you know, it's really important to work that the schools and industry work together. Well, that's great. But then you'll talk to a school or a manufacturer for that part. And they say, you know, that's great. We've tried, but it's, it's hard. So how, not only what works, but how did they make it work? So, so that's, and that's just one thing that, that, that we're working on under a grant. So, you know, between efforts like that, efforts going on with the governor's workforce council and the office of workforce strategy, uh, there's some really great recommendations on the way. As you may know, they've created a whole slew of subcommittees and they've had, you know, over a hundred people offer to volunteer their time to, to, uh, to drill down on these issues. But, but from the big standpoint, I, I, I think uh, uh, we need to build the system that, that uh, focuses on, on reskilling so that the, the person, you know, the robot comes in, it doesn't replace a person. Um, what it does is it allows that person to learn maybe how to run the cobot, robot or cobot, or as equally as important and, and a real concern at this point, how to f maintain and fix the darn thing when, you know, when it breaks or it's not functioning. That's really critical too, uh, to, to making this all work. So there's tons of opportunities and will be more opportunities for training and job placement on, um, for existing workers. Um, and, and, and also we're looking at, you know, the incarcerated community, the veteran community, um, traditionally, you know, uh, com communities that traditionally aren't, um, you know, involved in, 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 uh, in these kind of pursuing these kind of careers. So there's a lot of great thinking and, and, a, and a lot of reason to be optimistic, but there's, you know, still much work to be done, but I think we can be, I, I think we can be really, um, optimistic about where we're heading. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. And I think you you really highlighted the, the opportunity we have here on reskilling and upskilling workers. And you know, particularly, as you said, with our retiring manufacturing workforce, um, the, the ability to capture that expertise and, and talent. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear you're working with the Governor's Workforce Council on, on all of this um, because it's such an opportune moment. Um, so two other questions I have with respect to the, the actual technology um, you know, is there anything you think we can be doing between now and when the, I know it looks like the report would be due by next October, but anything kind of in, in the short term that you think we can be doing to help ensure we can um, make sure our small manufacturers have access to this technology and kind of the short-term training that they might need this next year? Well, I think um, certainly one thing, and it, and it was, you know, basically the highest priority on the CMC's manufacturing uh, uh, wish list, if you will, for this year was to try and make sure that that manufacturing innovation fund uh, gets gets refunded. I mean, that not only uh, it has a technology program, the MVP program, uh, but it also, uh, you know, helps with the apprenticeship placement and funding and uh, programs that are really important to small and mid-sized manufacturers, especially. So um, that would certainly be one thing uh, in the uh, in, in the interim, um, um, and I, you know, I, I guess I just have to say, um, uh, you know, get the get the whip out on this advisory group, um, and and uh, you know, get them moving, and uh, you know, uh, develop that that ecosystem. It'll take a little bit of time, but that time will go by quickly, and um, you know, I think it'll be a like I said, the, the title of the bill is pretty unassuming, but um, if we can get the work product out of this group, that, that plan, and get the various stakeholders to buy into it, uh, uh, it's just going to make a world of difference. Yep, absolutely. And, and couldn't agree with you more. And, and thanks for mentioning the, the MIF, and we'll definitely be you know, fighting for, for that funding. Um, and then um, just a uh, final question. I know that you at CBA, you always are good at you know, conducting surveys of, of your members and getting insights into their needs. And I know, um, you know, transportation barriers, taxes, um, you know, talent is always kind of at the top of their list. And I'm wondering if, if this has come up in responses from, from businesses in terms of attracting talent for this sort of industry 4.0, if, if you're hearing that or anything, you know, anecdotally you're hearing from business owners on the talent need? 
Yeah, there's no question. Uh, I mean, it's becoming more and more clear that what businesses are, are chasing, you know, as they decide sort of where to locate and where to grow, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to minimize some of the other issues uh, that are important for those decisions, but they're chasing talent. Um, that's, that's what it's all about. I, not all about, but that's, that's a, just a huge factor right now. So, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're asking about, you know, what we're hearing from our members on various priorities, um, you know, certainly within the manufacturing community, uh, it's, it's basically talent, talent, talent. Um, but talent includes talent to, to run, you know, I4.0 type technologies and to service those technologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can assure you in the manufacturing community, it's, uh, it, it's, it's at the top of the list. Got it. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being with us today for your testimony and uh, all you do for our manufacturing industry. And thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you, um, uh, Co-Chair uh, Simmons. And uh, I don't see any other question or hands raised here, um, Eric. A very, very interesting conversation. Um, uh, and, and thank you for um, bringing forth this proposal uh, to the committee. Uh, and we look forward to, you know, continuing to refine it and um, move it along. Uh, so seeing no other hands, thanks, Eric, for being with us. So, um, may, may I just, I don't know if I'm still last on the list or not, but. Yeah, you are. I just want to take this opportunity. Um, like I said, it's been a long time since I testified here, and I'm not sure if and when it will be again. So I just want, I have to say publicly what an honor it's been to work with you and the committee. Uh, on so many different issues uh, to help uh, to help Connecticut, not just on the business side of things, but to find ways to make make it a better state, whether it's environmental policy or or what have you. And all of you, uh, you know, are are uh, the fact that you're here this afternoon and have stayed this long, and it's this important to you. It's just uh, it's very uh, appreciated and. Uh, but Senator, uh, you know, for as long as I've been crawling around the, the Senate hallways, um, you know, I, I have to say, I, because I've been doing this 27 years, I'll, 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 I'll expand a little bit, take the prerogative. You know, I, I don't talk about it much, and I don't know if you know it, but my dad was uh, elected to the House of Representatives in 1952. And in 1957, as Speaker, he had an issue on a particular day that put him in a very difficult spot. And those who were there that day uh, often characterized it as a, a profile in courage. And I think when I think about, you know, working the floor on the third floor of the Senate and watching your work, uh, you know, I, I, I think of it as watching a profile in courage uh, pretty much every day. I mean, uh, principled, tough, smart, indefatigable. Um, it's just, it's just been a real honor to be able to work with you. And I uh, so much appreciate that. And hopefully, we can work together with the committee and the legislature as a whole to get this, uh, get this one over the line too. But I just felt I had to say that. Thank you very much. Well, that thank you very much. And uh, let me just say that it's really no one person. And Eric, you have been so integral and in the achievements that we've made. Um, and I hate to say this, but um, I hope you're not going too far because you have been visionary, um, you know, in trying to move around some of the, you know, the traditional roadblocks that have, uh, you know, previously kind of stopped us in our tracks. And, um, you know, so we're, we're team commerce and it's, you know, the leadership here with Representative Simmons and uh, Senator Martin and Rep Buckby and, um, you know, all of the incredible people who serve on this committee. And I want to just take this moment right now to say we've got another new superstar with us, and that is Senator Pat Billy Miller. And I want everybody to, uh, you know, take our hats off and say, uh, welcome. We're so uh, graced to have you choose and be on the Commerce Committee. I don't know how that happened, but you know, thank you. 
Um, and I think, you know, once again, Eric, uh, you know, working with pr private sector, public sector, we demonstrate the public private, um, you know, uh, relationships that can really make a difference. And so um, thank you for being here and everybody, um, we are so pleased to have our new newest member that is, you know, Senator um, Patricia Billy Miller. So um, it's, it's just, you know, the little engine that could um, and it is team commerce. So on that note, um, thank you, Eric and uh, Rep Simmons, um, any uh, closing remarks? Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair, for, for the great hearing. I just want to echo those sentiment, sentiments that we're so excited to have. Senator Miller on the Commerce Committee couldn't be more uh, proud to get to serve with you in, in the Stanford delegation. We're so looking forward to having your leadership on the committee. So uh, welcome, and uh, we can't, can't wait to, to have you on this committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, my ranking, um, is Senator Martin still with us? Oh, it, there's so much stuff going on today. It's just, I mean, I still have one more committee yet to vote in myself. Um, this being that the fourth, the third, I can't even remember. Um, and Rep Buckby is, he probably had to sign off as well. But anyway, um, uh, uh, Senator Miller, um, would you like to make any comments? I just want to say thank you for the introduction and I'm excited to be a part of uh, Team Commerce. Okay, we, you know, we're gonna have to get sweatshirts, I think, you know, some team commerce sweatshirts. <laughs> okay, um, Madam Administrator, um, you know, I see no other people on our list today. Um, am I, um, am I uh, neglecting anything? <laughs> no, I think you pretty much covered it all. Okay, thank you. Um, everybody be well, stay safe, um, and of course, to be continued. Thanks Thank for being you. here, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.